best place to hide the truth is in the pages of a book. just read maybe we should just read Reviews. Yes, hello, good evening, and welcome to Hayes Reviews indeed. Uh, this is Nick, I'm the creator of Hayes Reviews, and we are back for another live stream, continuing with our exciting reading of the story of the Rockefeller Foundation by Raymond B. Fosdick. So I hope you can all hear me out there, and the broadcast is coming through loud and clear. I've been having a lovely day today, out and about with my beloved wife, uh, looking for houses and uh, viewing them and you know, asking lots of questions and being nosy and looking in cupboards and uh, <laughs> making decisions about where we're going to live because we're planning on moving uh, to a new place at uh, some point this year. So uh, keep an eye out for that. My, uh, my background and my broadcast situation might look a little bit differently later on, but I hope you're all having a really good weekend. 
Uh, it's been really windy here in the northwest of England. Lots of uh, kind of signposts being blown around and wheelie bins and uh, these, you know, Cafe Nero sort of standing signs they put outside their coffee shop flying across the street. And uh, we were sitting in a cafe today and the door get, kept getting opened. <laughs> and so it, it's been pretty intense wind wise, but a lot of sun. Uh, and I've, I've, as you might be able to see, I'm not sure if you can see, but I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit shinier than usual because I put a bit of uh, sort of moisturizer on my head because I thought my skin might be a bit dried out from all the sun today. But that is to say that I've had a lovely day, got home, had some food, and I thought I don't have anything better to do with my Saturday night than carry on with this book because the Tuesday and the Thursday readings, you know, we're getting into it now. You can see here we're, we're is that, yeah, we're about halfway and, you know, some parts of this book are more interesting and exciting than others. There was a lot of setup at the beginning, a lot of description of uh, uh, John D. Rockefeller Sr. and then his son, and then also Frederick T. Gates, who was heavily involved in helping them decide how to spend their money. And so we've had this, and then there was a whole chapter about the legal setup and the, and the public pushback against this foundation being uh, created in the first place and how they kind of set up the, 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 the I suppose, the structure of the foundation. Uh, and I don't know a lot about all that uh, sort of legality of these kinds of things, but it was my kind of feeling that they just wanted to keep this money you know, if they if they kept hold of it, then it's going to be taxed or if they pass it on, there's going to be some sort of uh, cut taken by the government. But if they set up this foundation, then it, the foundations are tax free. And now you've got this massive chunk of money that you are free to invest wherever you deem uh, the best to do so. And they tell us that it's from a place of love and philanthropy and care and they're trying to improve uh, things for everybody. But I think if you look at what has happened over the last hundred years since they set this foundation up and the, the legacy that this Rockefeller Foundation has left in our world, you know, the, the effects and the outcomes speak for themselves. Uh, so it's been very interesting to, to read about how they this kind of narrative that they were just cursed with this vast amount of wealth and they didn't know how to do with it. And it was, and it was so hard for them to figure out the, the difficulty of, of giving it was described in one place. And so, um, it's been good. But then, then the last couple of chapters, the last four chapters, it really got interesting because then we learned about the massive amounts of investment in China, for example. Uh, it turns out that China was the number two, a uh, place that they've invested the most amount of funds uh, or at the time of the writing of this book, that was the case. So there's a very close link between uh, this particular family and China. Uh, and isn't that interesting when we n look at the origins of, uh, you know, the big, the big, the great flu of 2020 that, that went around the world? Where did that come from? Where, where were we told that came from? And then also when we look at the kind of geopolitical context of things, we know that there's kind of a divide being set up with with the sort of uh, European and its allies and, and America on one side, and then you've got kind of Russia and India and China and what's known as the BRICS nations on the other side. And this is kind of uh, very telling because we see here in this book, and as admitted by the president of the foundation himself, that these sort of narratives of, of divide, uh, of, of war and conflict between nations, that's really for the public consumption because behind the scenes and above the scenes and at the very top of, of these countries and organizations, people are shaking hands and doing deals and spending money and helping each other out. <laughs> and so this is a really stark admission of the fact that that is the case. Wealthy families uh, and, 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 and powerful and influential families, they see themselves beyond nationhood. They are globalist. And, and I, I opened the very first video in this series, actually, with a quote from David Rockefeller's memoirs. Uh, this, this hefty one here. And, uh, and in here, I've marked up the page where he admits to being a globalist. Now, if you're kind of new to the series or you haven't had a chance to go back and, uh, you know, catch up from video one, that is probably worth revisiting. Uh, so... Let's just have a look at that quickly. So it's this, uh, this, this bit here. Uh, and he says, Some even believe that we are part of a secret cabal working against the best interest of the United States, characterizing my family and me as 
internationalists and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure. One world, if you will. If that's the charge, I stand guilty and I am proud of it. Right there. And that is his book. And that is his signature on the front page. <laughs> so, <laughs> signed admission of this family and what they're up to from, uh, this would be David Rockefeller. Um, pretty incredible stuff. I'll put that over there, actually. So what, what we're kind of unveiling and learning about is is the way things work at the higher upper echelons of power and control and influence and wealth. And the stories that we get fed down here, lower down the pyramid of nations competing with each other uh, and uh, political parties competing one against each other, uh, you know, all the, all the kind of uh, us versus them narratives where you're led to pick a side and it's often the blue team and the red team, uh, whether that's politics or football or it might be um, music, or it might be fashion. You know, I often hear my father's stories about how he, uh, they, when he was growing up, there were the mods and the rockers. And uh, the mods were into a certain kind of music and had a certain style and drove a certain sort of uh, sort of motorbike, although I'm not sure you'd call them a motorbike. I think it was a moped. And then the rockers, they had a different style of clothes, different style of music, and a, a different kind of motorbike that they drove. And, and you, you, you were one or the other. And uh, he was telling me the other night about how actually he he liked elements of both, uh, particularly when it came to the music. So he might, I think The Who, uh, they had an album Quadrophenia, that was the mods, but then there was also the rockers and they had a whole different set of bands. But dad was quite, he quite liked The Who, but his friends were the leather jacket wearing motorbike, motorcycle riding rockers. And if they found out that he liked any elements of the other side, you know, they would tease him or even worse, they might beat him up a little bit or whatever. They'd, they'd give him some grief about it. And that's just a, the classic example. Exactly that, but is happening on all these other levels as well, whether it's kind of... Uh, Political parties, as I mentioned, or religions, for example, organized religions playing off one group against another, uh, whether it's the, um, you know, counties, it might be one county against another or a st one state against another in America or the East Coast and the West Coast in America. You know, it's how, how many ways can they chop people into two groups and pit those two groups against each other while at the very top. That, that is the game that they're playing. It's like, how, how, how many of these divide and rule, divide and conquer strategies can we roll out while they're just laughing, shaking hands and making deals and just hoovering up <laughs> all the wealth and, uh, and, the, and, the, uh, and the valuable things such as land and property and, uh, you know, fine wines and the best quality food uh, and the precious metals and, and all these sorts of things, right? So yeah, as Peter said, always been this way. It has been this way for a long time. So we are told according to the history books. But you know, a lot of history is uh, deceive, deceitful and lies and it's written by the victors. So how much of it can we really believe? And I agree that uh, it does seem to have always been this way. Back to the sort of times of the Pharaoh and ancient Egypt. It sort of, it seems to be that this tiny parasite class of maniacs <laughs> are playing the long, 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 long game. And they figured out human psychology to such an extent that they can quite effortlessly maintain this control and power through the ages, even though we feel like we're rolling through these different times and eras. Uh, it actually, it's probably the same group of people, the same lineage, families, bloodlines, whatever, who are, who are still managing to stay on top of the, uh, on top of the pile. And so it seems to me that the Rockefellers might be one of those families. <laughs> I'm not sure, but I have a hint, I have a bit of a suspicion. So, but you know, I don't want to spread any uh, theories or any guesses. I'm I'm literally more interested in let's look at the book, uh, the books that they write and read what they say. So that's what we're doing on this channel. We've we've read H.G. Wells, we've read Bertrand Russell. Uh, we're into and now we're into the president of the Rockefellers Foundation own story about this foundation. And so came out in the last reading i just wanted to go back to that page quickly and i've tabbed it here what came out in the last reading that was very surprising to me was a few things it was a couple of things actually but one was the admission that this foundation funded uh alfred kinsey's work so that was one thing and then on this page here 
you can see we've got uh, the admission that in Great Britain, for example, research grants were made for neurosurgery and psychiatry at the University of Edinburgh and the London Hospital, for neurophysiology at Cambridge University and the Burden Neurological Institute at Bristol, for human heredity at the Galton Laboratory of the University of London, for psychiatry at Tavistock Clinic in London. So these two stood out to me. Got Tavistock Clinic I've heard about. Which, uh, which I just learned is that was the original uh, name and then it became the Tavistock Institute for Human Relations. It's quite an infamous uh, institute in the circles of research, research and, and, and uh, I don't know how to name the circles that we swim in. I don't like to name it, in fact. It's better to, you, I think you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Tavistock Institute of Human Relations, you know, quite notorious. Galton Laboratory, though, I hadn't heard of that one before. And so I thought what I would do today is I would look up and learn a bit about the Galton Laboratory. And so I went straight to Wikipedia and I typed in Galton Laboratory and once again, Wikipedia delivered the goods, like straight away. And so without any further ado, let us get into some um, preamble. Okay. Uh, oh, hang on. We got a few comments. Let's have a look at those first. Gwen and Richard, good evening. Heidi, Adam, good to have you here. Lovely. Peter, oh, I already mentioned you, Peter, didn't I? Well, you get two mentions. Doubly good to have you here. Uh, Heidi says, I was a citizen of the world. Thank God I woke up. Yeah. Yeah. Thanking God. It, and, you know, for me, and I was saying to a friend the other day that really my whole life trajectory has changed since I started praying. I won't say any more than that. I'm not telling anyone to do anything with regards to religion or or anything spiritual, you know, spiritual wise. I think it, it's up to each of us to pursue that path for ourselves and see where it leads us. But for me, I can hand on heart say that starting to pray did change my life. So I would recommend people to explore that, especially if you're skeptical and you're unsure about it, you know. So, yeah, I agree that with what you say, Heidi, spiritual warfare every moment no thought, action, or inaction is neutral. Yeah, the stakes are high, and it, every one of us has a, has a part to play in it. And I think we've been trained by television and, and media to be, uh, to be um, what's the word? You know, when you're, when you're kind of a peeping Tom, like a voyeur, you know, you, you're watching things, you're not participating. And uh, Richard Grove says in, in, in his autonomy course that entertainment is watching other people have fun. Entertainment is watching other people do things with their lives. And think about it. We watch other people and it might be a, an action film where the hero is saving the day. It might be some drama uh, where the friends are going on an adventure together or some family drama where a couple is coming to overcome some romantic issues or whatever it is. We're just watching other people live their lives and they're fake people most of the time, you know, they're fake imaginary people cooked up by whoever writes the scripts and, and writes the stories. And it's not a reflection of reality. And we do that at the cost and expense of living our own lives and having our own adventures and, and overcoming our own problems and defeating our own, slaying our own dragons, right? So it's a very strange thing that we've been uh, conditioned into. And I think um, that quote Heidi is really on the money because yes every second counts you're not going to get any second back that's for sure it's uh you know every second every moment is is gone and then it's gone for good and then it's and every moment you spend then becomes indelibly uh, written into the record of time and part of the cause and effect nature of of time and, and the reality that we live in which is everything that happened before led up to the present moment and has this momentum going on into the future and so this is why it's so critically important to take very c good care of our actions and the way we speak and the way we think, especially thinking, is very important because because thinking pre precedes action. And uh, you know that uh, everything around us, I always say everything I'm looking at, the screen, the monitor, the lights, the, the webcam, the books, all of this stuff was in a person's mind. And then they took action and now it's a real thing manifest in the world that we can pick up and see and touch and interact with, right? So it all starts in the mind. And so thinking is critically important and it all adds up. And so the more that we can kind of move ourselves towards intentionality and consciousness, and I mean consciousness just like in the sense of being aware, how am I talking to myself? How am I talking to other people? How do I think about myself? How do I think about other people when they're not here? Just trying to push that towards better, 
you know, towards what your conscience says would be a better way of doing things. And that's, that's a large part of it going inside, you know, and, and praying and, and, and praying to God and then listening to, to whatever comes up, whatever voice you then hear. And that's kind of your conscience and then listening to that and, and then letting that be your guide as, as we learned in the Pinocchio film. Always let your conscience be your guide. There you go. A little singing for you this evening. All right. I think that's enough rambling, but great comment, I think. So let's get into, oh, just one point here. Gwen says, better to read novels. So I think that's in relation to this conversation on entertainment. Yeah, absolutely. Read a novel. Uh, if you want If you want to peek into the lives of other people, you know, do it in a way that stimulates the most of your brain, your imagination, your language, your, uh, cause you will pick up so much, the narrative, the details and, and by imagining and putting yourself in there through the power of words and narrative, it, it's a way more, um, comprehensive and emotionally, um, connecting way to, to get that sort of, whether it's escapism, which I think we all benefit from from time to time, or just that connecting with a story and a character that isn't our own. When our own lives are overwhelming and tiring and we need a little break and we need to just go somewhere else for a while, novels are a much better option than, uh, I don't know, Big Brother or Love Island or Coronation Street <laughs> or or any, any of those, uh, particularly the newer ones that are coming out because a lot of those are full of just downright satanic mind control programming. So... <laughs> Keep an eye out for the television. Anyway, into, I got a few tabs ready. So let's look, as I was saying uh, earlier, and we started with, um, I started talking about the Galton Laboratory, which I had not heard of until I read about it in this book. So I thought, all right, let's check out what is the Galton Laboratory. And it tells us right here on Wikipedia, the Galton Laboratory was a laboratory established for the research of eugenics, later to the study of biometry and statistics and eventually human genetics, based at University College London in London, England. The laboratory was originally established in 1904 and existed in name until 2020. So that's quite a legacy. That is 116 years of, uh, of this thing being in existence. And it says in name, but, you know, come on, it was there and it had this name, therefore it existed, <laughs> okay? And it was established specifically for the study of eugenics. So let's look at the history. The Eugenics Record Office, this was a precursor to the Galton Laboratory established in 1904 by Francis Galton. So that's a good name to be aware of and just keep in mind a little more on him in a moment. The Department of Applied Statistics and Eugenics. So the Galton Laboratory was financed by Francis Galton on his death in 1911, Francis Galton left his estate to the University of London to fund a permanent chair of eugenics filled by Carl Pearson. So Francis, Francis Galton loved eugenics so much, he, he, he left his whole estate to make sure there would permanently be a, a role there, a chair of eugenics, uh, continuing this, this passion of his. Uh, but interestingly, the Pearson... Pearson uh, who was funded by Francis Galton, created the Department of Applied Statistics. Now, if you were here for the last video, we learned uh, about, in, uh, from Raymond Fosdick, about how this, this pursuit of public health had, had, was, was kind of the, the Trojan horse, which contained within it, and, and I think, and it wasn't explicitly stated, but it, you know, it kind of follows, to me, I think, the, the Trojan horse contained within it this need to uh, keep records on everybody, because how do you how do you track a disease or an outbreak of something, you know, or a, a, a sort of uh, an, um, the they started with mosquitoes, and you gotta you gotta know who's got it and who hasn't in order to track how it's spreading, in order to head it off and, and deal with the outbreak, right? You gotta keep records who on who? Well, everybody, everybody in the community, right? You need to know everybody and how healthy they are and how sick they are and, and what conditions they've got and, and what kind of symptoms they've got. You need to know all that. And so I, I feel like this, this pursuit of public health was the, the Trojan horse which delivered this data gathering and record keeping. So it's very interesting that the uh, Galton Laboratory funded by the Rockefellers uh, became or, or led to the creation of this Applied Statistics Department because, of course, uh, applied statistics is going to involve gathering lots of data, isn't it? So we can crunch the numbers 
and eventually let our AI overlords decide what is best to do for all of us. Um, so that's been a really key sort of revelation to me, at least, while, while reading this book. Very, very interesting. So the Department of Human Genetics and Biometry. The Galton Laboratory underwent many changes during, during the post-war period. Most notably, this period saw another renaming of the department following the negative associations of eugenics after World War II. So renaming, what, they, what that word should actually be is rebranding, which, which, get, which happens a lot. Uh, it happens. It happened in 2020, where one condition uh, became another condition, and that one disappeared. And I'm talking about the flu here was rebranded, and it disappeared. Look it up. It actually did. They tell. They told us it disappeared. It's just gone. <laughs> How about that? But I think they rebrand the uh, the oligarchy. You know, the royalty is rebranded. Uh, the 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 structures of control in society just get rebranded, and they. You know, so we're told that we've left behind the age of kings and queens because that was all barbaric or whatever. And now we're in the age of a uh, liberal democracy. But if, but if you looked at the structure of society and who hold and what number of percentage of people hold, you know, the, the overwhelming um, control over resource and wealth and influence, then I would say it's still probably, you know, this kind of shape, a pyramid shape with a very small number at the top and most of the rest of us at the bottom. So it's a rebranding of the department here. Uh, and this was done by Harry Harris in 1966, where it was where where it was rebranded and renamed the Department of Human Genetics and Biometry. So this is really really critical and crucial to 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 know about because what we're learning here is that eugenics became genetics, and I think that blew my mind. I didn't know about that. You know, it was a few years ago, couple, two or three maybe, when I first heard that. And, and, and then it's, it's amazing to me to have a book here that, that qualifies that or, or, or a book and a Wikipedia article, I suppose. But it's telling you that eugenics was rebranded human genetics. And then as uh, we've discussed in my Telegram group, that human genetics has now been rebranded uh, and has a new name, which, com which is transhumanism. OK, and so there's that continuity and rebranding, but it's the same ethos. It is the same way of thinking. It is the same motivation, the same goal the same philosophy. It's the same set of values and actions and, and people doing it to this other group of people. Yet they just give it a new name and tell, tell you it's progress and people cheer it on. <laughs> um, so they, in 1967, the laboratory moved to a new building. Uh, they got the Human Biochemical Genetics Unit and Experimental Genetics Unit. How about that? So this Experimental Genetics Unit, has, has there been any... Experiment, experimental genetics uh, products rolled out recently. <laughs> and the Galton Laboratory and its legacy at UCL, so this bit is uh, quite interesting too. In June 2020, so June 2020, that's, uh, that's lockdown one, right? UCL issued a formal apology for its history and legacy of eugenics. You've got to look at the timing of these things, right? This play has been around for 116 years and it took them till June 2020 in the midst, in the, in the immediate rollout of the most unprecedented um, global scam that's ever been concocted. What are we into it at that point? Four months into it or something? Two, three, four months into it? And that They chose that moment to issue a formal apology for the history and legacy of eugenics. This followed a report and comprehensive set of recommendations given to UCL in February 2020 from its official inquiry into the history of eugenics. Additionally, UCL announced that the institution would be denaming uh, spaces and buildings named after Francis Galton and Carl Pearson. Okay, and then and then this, this really was quite... Uh, this is something I want to look more into. It says nine of the inquiry's original 16 members did not agree to sign the report. So timing is so important. Why at this point, you know, is it because the job's done? It's like we, we've, you know, it's almost like, remember the, remember the Georgia Guidestones? They got detonated and blown up after standing for however long they were up there with the, it's almost like, well, we've done that now so we can, we can blow the stones up. We don't need them anymore. We've, we've, we've achieved a certain level of progress in our plan that we don't need to leave those things standing anymore. To me, the, the timing can't be a coincidence. I don't believe in coincidences. So 
interesting, and I think you will agree, revealing that the Rockefellers are, are funding, you know, the Galton Laboratory, and not at all surprising. Um, so, on the topic of Francis Galton, uh, I had a member of my um, do, 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 Telegram group tell me about this channel, Biographics. I've never been here before, but it's got a lot of subscribers, very high production value, and it's just uh, lots and lots of videos giving 20-minute, uh, 25-minute biographies of various characters. And I, I was scrolling through the list, and I'm not, not a lot of people I was that interested in, but then I found Francis Galton, the man who invented eugenics. So this is uh, the, the man who gave his name to the laboratory that the Rockefellers were funding. This video is not, I wouldn't say... I mean, I skipped actually to this section here, which is eugenics. All this is just his life. But it tells you about his involvement with Charles Darwin. It tells you about uh, him, his travel, his early life. And, and you can see here that this, this, this name, Galton, is closely linked to the name Darwin. I think it was two families and they, have, they shared sort of some common ancestry and some overlap. But I would, I would, uh, I'll put a link to this video because it's a nice little primer for anyone who doesn't know about this gentleman. But what's really good about it is if you go down here and you look at the sources, there's lots of sources here. And for further reading, uh, JSTOR articles uh, and uh, information specific to the UK, the US, and the uh, Tiny Mustache Man, Sweden, and the Soviet Union. So actually, it's a good resource to have to, uh, to dive into and look at the links underneath. So I'll link that underneath. But that little section here on eugenics is, is pretty good. It's worth watching. Because um, it's surprising that these things, uh, we know about eugenics, but I think in the minds of most people, most people who've just been through schooling, it's just the thing that happened in Germany in, in the 1930s and, and 40s, and then it never happened again. I think that's pretty much how most people view it. And they're just unaware that actually it goes back further than that. And it started in America <laughs> and all the people who were into it and, and enjoyed it just rebranded it after the second world war and carried on doing it. <laughs> Key critical information. I think you would agree. So thank you to uh, Mushroom Zulu for giving me, uh, uh, putting me onto this channel. I'm going to watch more of their videos, but it's a good place to, to get a nice concentrated dose of, uh, of information about historical people. But I wanted to go into uh, this and mention this book, right? So this is The Next Million Years by Charles Galton Darwin. So, so we've just been talking about uh, the Galton Laboratory, which was um, Francis Galton, his, his, uh, his creation. And then we go here to this book, Charles Galton Darwin. So Darwin, that's, that's a very key name. I'm sure we all know why that name is, is, is important. And it's interesting to see them both together, this double barrel name. And this is a book from 1953. Uh, and I don't have a copy of this book, unfortunately. And you can only have a limited preview because the Internet Archive doesn't want you to know what's in this book. <laughs> but I would uh, recommend people to try and get their hands on a, a physical or a PDF copy of this because it's one of those books which uh, kind of told you what was coming ahead of time. And that's why it's hard to find and get hold of. And you even struggle to read it for free online. Uh, you, yeah, look at this. You've got to log in and borrow and renew it every hour. Pending availability. How can a digital, how can a set of ones and zeros, not which are infinitely copyable, not be available? So you see, this is the real-time memory holding. This is what we're up against. This is why physical copies of books are so important. Um, but get in that book and have a read of that. And note that these two names come together because... The um, and this is important. I, I do have a copy of this book, right? So Darwin is very important to this whole thing because Darwin's uh, theory of evolution, which, as we've talked about, is a theory, and uh, you know some of it, parts of it are good, and some parts of it are absolutely nonsense and really hard to believe. <laughs> but not a lot of people know. Most people know about this book, but not a lot of people know about the subtitle, which is. The Preservation of Favoured Races in the Struggle for Life. So he, he titled it, The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or 
the preservation of favored races. So this is very critical because the kind of mindset and the philosophy and the worldview of the people, the, the people who plan society, the people who roll out the kind of scams and schemes and have been doing for a very long time. This is their worldview, right? Some races are favored and must be preserved. And do you think that you and I are part of the favored races <laughs> and should be preserved? And it's this worldview that nature is, that might makes right and that only the most powerful will survive and, and, and ought to survive. And therefore anything you can do, which ensures your own, and your own survival and, uh, you know, no matter the cost is the right thing to do. And you can tell this is the picture they've given us here. And on the picture here, you've got this beaky thing chomping down on that neck thing. This beaky thing here is chomping down on that fish. This eel thing with creepy eyes is chomping down on this little lobster thing there. This is their view of the world. It's like eat or be eaten. Dog eat dog. And we hear these things all the time. We, we grow up with these kind of little snaps, um, snippets of, of their, their philosophy. And that's what they want to put into the world. Okay, that's, that's, that's what they believe and that's why, how they justify doing what they do. Whereas a lot of us kind of feel like, well, cooperation and collaboration is probably more uh, in tune with how things should work. Because, you know, you can go and sit in a field and it's not all eating and snapping and biting and violence and hunting and killing. You know, there's plenty of species that cooperate, that coexist, that co-depend on each other. So, so a large part of reality is that. Look at the, you know, the, the symbiotic relationship between, for example, clownfish and sea anemones. So if you didn't know that, but, but clownfish all live in certain sea anemones. Uh, and they live among the, uh, the tentacles of the anemone and they sort of clean it and help it out. And the anemone in return gives the clownfish protection. And I'm really proud of mentioning and remembering clownfish because that brings me on to my, to my next point that I want to talk about in this preamble after I've uh, just mentioned that book. I feel like this preamble is kind of a bit going wayward and all over the place, but it's useful. Tavistock Institute. So you might be wondering, what is the connection between clownfish and Tavistock Institute? Does anyone know it in the chat? I'll, I'll just uh, maybe pause for a minute and see. I'll have a sip and see if anyone knows the connection between the Tavistock Institute and Clownfish. I've got to wait, I suppose, for the stream to catch up with people. Um, I'll just go back to this camera for a second and maybe I'll get it. So there is a connection. I'm not just making it up. Clownfish are wonderful, by the way. They're very uh, sociable. And uh, when I was a scuba diving instructor, I used to uh, enjoy, not scuba diving, sorry, just uh, like snorkel diving. I didn't do any scuba diving. I used to do snorkel diving though. It was a lot of fun. I would go down and see the clownfish and they would sort of swim up to you and you could cup them in your hands and lift them up. And then you would let go and they'd go back down into the anemone. All right. So people aren't sure about what the link is between Tavistock and clownfish. So this is great. I get to teach you something that you don't already know, which uh, is my aim. So let's go back to the uh, article cam here. So let's have a look at this. This is the Wikipedia for clownfish. Caveat, don't always believe everything that's on Wikipedia, but it's a great place to start because it's, you know, it's a starting point, isn't it? So what I don't, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it here, but I don't know. I wouldn't know how to find it if I do a, do a control F on it either. So this, this bit's about how they can survive the sea anemone venom. So yes, they can survive that venom somehow. They're symbiotic. You can see that picture there. These things are poisonous, but the clownfish can live in them. And then, you know, it begs the question, which came first? Well, they were probably both designed at the same time. <laughs> okay, maybe it's this bit. So let's have a look. Reproduction. In a group of anemone fish, a strict dominance hierarchy exists. The largest and most aggressive female is found on the top. Only two anemone fish, a male and a female, in a group reproduce through external fertilization. Anemone fish are protandrous sequential hermaphrodites, meaning they develop into males first, and when they mature, they become females. If the female anemone fish is removed from the group, such as by death, one of the largest and most dominant males becomes a female. The remaining male males 
move up a rank in the hierarchy. Clownfish live in a hierarchy like hyenas, except smaller and based on size, not sex, and order of joining birth. So there you have it. And I'm sure it's a bit clearer in your minds now what the link is between Tavistock and clownfish. <laughs> um, so there's probably a reason why the clownfish was chosen for the uh, hit Pixar film Finding Nemo and Finding Nemo 2. I, I think there was a sequel to that, wasn't there? Yes. So Tavistock Clinic, again, funded by the Rockefellers, right? Uh, and this, uh, this uh, was admitted to in the last chapter. And so I thought we would have a little, a little revisit to, to what the Tavistock Institute is. It used to be called the Tavistock Clinic, but now it's the Tavistock Institute. And you can see here, the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations is a British not-for-profit social science organization. So it's still in existence today. It's still going. It was formed 76 years ago. Uh, and it is providing practical help for people and organizations to learn, lead, change and innovate, especially in difficult times. So this whole part about the uh, current activities is kind of not really telling us much that's useful or interesting. And it's certainly not mentioning much about the um, recent uh, controversies that it has been embroiled in. But the history of the Tavistock Institute tells us a little bit. The early history overlaps with that of the Tavistock Clinic because many of the staff from the clinic worked on new large-scale projects during World War II. And, at what, and it was as a result of this work that the Institute was established. Uh, and then this bit I highlighted because it says the clinic staff planned to become part of the, and the, the, what is it, the November Hotel Sierra when it was established. And they had been warned that such consultancy and research would not be possible. Because of this, the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations was created in 1947 to carry out work specifically with organizations once the clinic was incorporated into the November Hotel Sierra. And then here, the Rockefeller Foundation awarded a significant grant that facilitated the creation of the Institute. So it's admitted, it's public knowledge, it's public fact. It is not, uh, you know, theoretical. <laughs> it's not anything that is made up. It's not a guess. It's admitted to in Wikipedia and it's admitted to in this book. Um, but what is... What is the Tavik Stock Institute being embroiled in recently? And my reference for that is actually going to be a shameless plug for myself. So I did put two uh, two long form uh, podcasts, you know, video presentations out. In these, I read through a bunch of news stories, and uh, this one here is episode thirteen, which was called "Robots in These Guys." This was a most uh, more recent one, and we looked at books such as uh, this one here, the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations. And underneath this video, which I will link, is a whole host of other stories and resources and places to learn about this. And you'll find that uh, this institute is embroiled in a lot of, let's just call it clownfish activity. <laughs> well, that'll be our new code word now, I think, will be the clownfish activity. Okay, so uh, Tavistock Institute, you can check out for that, uh, my episode number 13, Hayes Reviews Lives, and also episode number five, uh, which was an early effort. And uh, you can see that I was less polished, polished and my background didn't look quite as good there. <laughs> but you know, I was learning and getting better uh, little by little. That's all it is. That's what it's all about. And it one foot in front of the other. So one final thing to, to, to put on the radar and link below is this video, which was sent to me in telegram by i think it was, i think his name's mark apologies if i got your name wrong but you know who you are and i had never seen this video before but it's very very intriguing and uh hopefully i muted that yeah let's uh just scroll down until we can skip this so this video is very short 16 minutes long and we'll speed it up and i'm not playing the audio because i don't want to flag anything but what he does he, he goes into and shows a lot of pictures of, uh, of members of the Rockefeller family. And he, he points out like a curious thing that's going on in these uh, pictures. Like, okay, for example, have a look at that. This is Alida Rockefeller. Clownfish, I would say. What do you think? Clownfish? <laughs> 
And so anyway, that's a really good video. I won't go through all of it now. It's 16 minutes, but it, I, it was a lot of stuff I'd never seen. It gives you new names, makes some new connections. And let's just say it paints a compelling picture as to why this family are funding the Tavistock Institute, because <laughs> it seems like they have a number of clownfish uh, among them. So uh, that is your kind of, I think that's all we got. Oh yeah, I did have a little bit about, uh, I wanted to talk about as well about this uh, pandemic agreement, WHO. I mentioned this in a Tuesday's live stream and I said that I couldn't find this quote in, in any sort of World Health Organization uh, documentation and I still can't. And I did have uh, Stella very kindly dig around and she sent me uh, this document, which is the one that I had found and it doesn't match so this one, this document here is, if you have a look, we'll go to the top. It is the Constitution of the World Health Organization. And it doesn't, it just doesn't have that quote that um, Dr. David, that is flashed up in, in this video of Dr. David Martin. You can see the formatting is different. The, the paragraphs are further apart. Um, so it's a really tricky one. It's, uh, it's kind of, I don't know, I don't know, I can't. I'm just saying I can't find that quote that's flashed up on that screen there. I'm not saying it doesn't exist and it isn't the case. What you can find in this one, which is downloadable from the WHO's website, is this section on legal capacity, privileges, and immunities. And it says, the, the organization shall enjoy in the territory of each member such legal capacity as may be necessary for the fil fulfillment of its objective and for the exercise of its function. Now, I'm not a lawyer, or a solicitor, as we say here in England. But what does that sound like to you? I know what it sounds like to me, but what does it sound like to you? It sounds to me like whatever, how does this say? Legal capacity as may be necessary for the fulfillment of its objective. So it sounds to me like if, if the fulfillment of the objective necessitates zero legal um, accountability, then then the organization shall enjoy that zero legal accountability because it's necessary for the fulfillment of the objective, right? Can you read it in that way? Or is it just me reading it in that way? Heidi's saying David Martin is quoting the new WHO document, I believe. Okay. Uh, that would, that would make sense. Yeah. So I need to get my hands on that and read it because, uh, so, because yeah, I haven't seen that. But this is the old one. So even in the old one, they're saying similar stuff, is, but it is my point here. Uh, and then it says, the organization shall enjoy in the territory of each member such privileges as immunities as may be necessary for the fulfillment of its objective and for the exercise of its function. So that's, uh, is that the same? That is exactly the same sentence, is it? No, no, sorry. So, so that's such privileges and immunities. So not only do they get whatever legal capacity they need, for the fulfillment, they also get privileges and immunities as may be necessary. And then it says the representatives and members, persons designated to serve on the board, personnel of the organization shall similarly enjoy such privileges and immunities as are necessary for the independent exercise of, it, of their functions in connect, excuse me, in connection with the organization, right? So, so all of that to me says, I w you would expect it to say uh, everything they do will be in line with the, the legal requirements of the, member of the member territory, the member state. That's what you would expect, but that's not what it says. <laughs> it says they will get whatever legal capacity, privileges, and immunities are necessary for the fulfillment of the objective. So yeah, they've been saying for a while, for sure. Uh, and, and if the new document has this further clarified, then that makes a lot of sense. And I'm sure that's uh, what David Martin is pointing to. But uh, I just wanted to mention that as well because uh, uh, I had Stellar send this one to me again and I'd already seen this one. But yeah, critical stuff. Okay, lastly, I did mention as well, I think on Tuesday stream that we'll, we'll, we need to get into some um, solutions. And this was uh, posted in the Grand Theft World Liberty Radio Telegram group by Lieutenant Colonel Drizzle. And he said he uh, left this downloading overnight. It is a mega pack of lectures all about health. Uh, and it's like seven gigabytes or something huge. But you can see here, you can grab it, JPEG, MPEG, or a torrent if you prefer. 
And uh, this is Compass. This is a health series by Barbara O'Neill. Now, if you are like me and you're always watching clips that people share in various groups or whatever, you've probably seen this lady. Uh, I'll mute this and play a little bit, and then you can get a better view of her. Uh, let's see if we can skip to a bit where she's talking. So she might look familiar to one or two of you out there. Uh, and I've seen plenty of clips of her and every clip I've seen of her, she's talking rock solid sense. And so if you're in the market for solutions, this is a, this is a bit of archive, internet archive data that they are giving us. Our, our, our kind and loving overlords are, are letting us have this bit of information. They're not letting us have that uh, Next Million Years book by Charles Colton Darwin. Was that his name? I get mixed up with all these double barrel names and first names and whatnot. But, but you can have this and you can download it. And you've got the cause of disease, medical missionary, the true cause of disease, parts two and three, true remedies. So water, allergies, information, uh, liver detox, hormone imbalance, uh, the eight laws of health, true remedies, pure air, sunshine, herbs as a natural remedy. So remember when we when we've been talking about how the Rockefellers moved their operation to China, as as somebody in the chat very rightly pointed out, and and started investing there, and started uh, pouring all this money into the establishment of the allopathic medical system. What was being lost, and I think you know this herbal knowledge of herb, herbs as a natural remedy is, is part of what was lost. So. You can get some of that. The acid alkaline balance, fantastic fats, food menus, massage, three sections on the gastrointestinal tract. So I've spoken before about how this idea that disease uh, begins in the gut and you can have leaky gut. And then if you have leaky gut, then the things you eat are going to get into your bloodstream without being broken down, digested properly and pass through you as they should with a non-leaky gut. So incredibly important that if you don't have your gut sorted out, it's going to be very hard to resolve any other issues. Uh, and then, yes, how to set up a health retreat. That is one that I think would be incredibly important. Mental law and the power of routines, children's health and the brain. So there, there is some learning and full of solutions. And that would be very much worth grabbing hold of, sticking on a hard drive or a pen drive somewhere, preserving it. So, you know, so that you've got it in case of some sort of internet wipeout or whatever. And I forgot to mention as well, one further resource uh, which I have mentioned in the the uh, Hayes Reviews art Hayes Reviews Lives episodes, but I'll mention here again just in case anyone hasn't seen those. Uh, is this book, which is the Clownfish Industrial Complex by Scott Howard. Now this is uh, this is not one that I think we we definitely can't read this on the um, live stream because I think the gentleman is still alive and writing books and putting them out there. But check out the size of the font. <laughs> This is the smallest font I think of it. It's like a Bible. <laughs> Any book, every book I have, this is like the smallest font in all these books. But what I have to say is this is quite hard to find, but it is incredibly, incredibly well-referenced and researched. And it's got a really good, like one of the, you know, you know a good book, right? You know a really good, I'll tell you a top tip here. You know a really good book when they have footnotes at the bottom of the page that you're reading Okay, and the older books used to do this, and newer ones they'll send you, they'll have all the footnotes at the back, so you're constantly like going to the back. And and if you're like me and you're a bit lazy, you'll probably skip over checking the references. But if the reference that you know the the reference number and and the footnote is right at the bottom of the page, you got no excuse. You can go down there and check it out and follow up with it. This book's like that, so incredibly well researched and well referenced. Uh, lots of appendices, uh, and yeah check it out. I haven't read all of this yet. I've just dipped in to find certain things, but this is all about how this client, this clownfish industrial complex has, has been, um, m uh, built, created, and then sort of weaponized against us, you know, and it's got our children and its targets. Uh, it's got many of our, I don't know, it's young people, isn't it? It's mainly aimed at young people. Let's, let's be honest here. And so, um, very good to know the history of it. Who's funding it in particular, uh, where the money's coming from for that. Uh, and, you know, we found out the Rockefellers are at least partially responsible for funding it. Um, but they're not the only ones, not by a long shot. So there's a lot of funding streams going into that particular uh, uh, effort. So that's my little preamble before we get right into the book. How are you getting on in the chat, everybody? 
Uh, yeah, so it was Heidi. Yeah, so you said they moved it to China. Yeah, exactly. So they moved. They just moved their operations to China, didn't they? Really. Um, Heidi says, "Looks like a great channel. Thank you. You're very welcome." Peter says, "Have you read the original with all of the thus and these f's for s's, etc.? I have, and Darwin only references that once, as far as the survival of the fittest. They distorted his writings. Yeah." Yeah, I'm not surprised. I think it all. I think this is why new editions are always being released of books, right? I found a book today. Um, I'll just flash it on the camera. I won't read it out because I'll probably get the channel banned. But, but I just found this one today, Edward the Seventh, and his and his uh, let's say juicy juicy court. And uh, and I found out this was a reprint. And then I got straight on and found out there was an earlier edition. And I thought, okay, maybe I can track down an earlier one. Because to my mind, the, the the multiple editions and reprintings are going to get edited and changed and altered and re and the wording changed so that you know the sting is taken out of it. I think that's why they do that. So that's why it's always get better to get our hands on the old copies, the first editions where possible. Less, much less chance of things being distorted and and uh, messed with, right? Uh, okay. Yeah. So Peter says wiki sold out cannot be trusted reference anymore. I agree. I agree. But at least, uh, but they do still, uh, you know, admit to things like in the case, you know, they, have, they corroborate what's in this book. So there are things on there. And as I said, as a starting point, but definitely take everything on there with a pinch of salt and, and verify it. It means PR says Skittles. Yeah. That's the clownfish reference, isn't it? Uh, Pixar and Disney, Heidi, I think are the same now. Yeah. William, hello. Good evening. Creationism. What religion is he? Well, I'm I'm not really a religion. I'm not really a I'm I don't know. I'm not I'm not I'm not willing to give myself a label, but I would say I believe in God and I believe that this place was created. It's about as far as I can go. <laughs> but I do like I said earlier, I think you might not have been here for that, but I was saying that since I started praying, my life has totally changed. And I don't want to go and get into any more than that because I know it's a very touchy topic. People are very charged up and they care and they find their religious religions very precious. What I would say is that I think it is obvious that that we are spiritual beings. You know, we're having a physical experience. There's a dimension to us that is spiritual. There are spiritual dimensions in uh, and around and permeating this 3D reality that we kind of see and experience. And and uh, that, that much is sh for sure. And I think there are entities and beings that are beyond our senses and, and are having influences on things. And, you know, I think this whole last four years experience has, has kind of shown a lot of people that um, there's evil at play. I mean, how else would you, how else would you, how else uh, label it, right? So, uh, yeah, William, exactly. Intelligent design is undeniable. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, un, it's undeniable. I would, I would just agree with that. You know, and anybody who wants to deny it is really not thinking about it very hard. And I have actually a bunch of books. You can't see them, but they're actually on above there. And there's a whole section there on Darwin refuting his uh, his macro evolution theory, um, and and pointing out the the reality is obviously designed. And that that's actually a book, uh, a set of books that I wanted to like create into a course or some sort of. Uh, digital download or resource that people could grab hold of and, and learn from because uh that was one of the big kind of uh that's one of the things that cracked me open to receive a lot more information and and to pursue truth with a more kind of dogged uh determination when i was like wait a second oh yeah obviously and, um, and actually one book that i would recommend that i really like is uh Tornado in a Junkyard by James Perloff. Um, that really is slim, very easy to read, and it just demolishes a lot of the the key claims of a macro Darwinian macro evolution. And then if you can break down and, and get get rid of Darwinism and Darwinian macro evolution, then you can move to like social Darwinism, right? And then you can kind of refute that and and, and there's a lot of value and knock-on effects to being able to state the case for creationism uh, and, and to point out the way, the fact that Mac Darwinian macroevolution is kind of hard to believe and the evidence isn't really there for it. They've had to assume a lot of information and, and, and evidence and like, oh, we'll find it eventually. We just haven't found it yet, but it's there. <laughs> Which is like, you don't get to do that, you know? 
Seleni, Seleni, Selenilion, Selenelion, Selenelion. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Good to have you here. Uh, oh, Nancy Turner Banks, MD. You know what? I've heard about that book, AIDS, Opium, Diamonds and Empire, and I haven't got it yet. But I've, I've, I can picture the front cover in my mind. It's got like an earth with a vice around it, hasn't it? I need to get hold of that one. But thank you for reminding me. Cool. Uh, William wants to look. You're going to look into that book. Wait there a sec. I got two. I'll give you two for the price of one. <laughs> so there's The uh, Tornado in a Junkyard by James Perloff. And he's he's really good. And he's very he's a good uh, gentleman. He'll if you get in touch with him, he'll reply. He even sent me a, f a PDF copy copy of one of his books, which I couldn't find to buy. And the subtitle there is very good: "The Relentless Myth of Darwinism." So that's a really good just first place to start because it's very easy to read, very well written. And then the other one, if you really want to get into it, is the Evolution Cruncher. And this is who's this Vance something. Vance Farrell. Yeah, v Vance Ferrell. Right? And look at that. That's about, I think it's 900, 900 pages. And every single page is, is packed full of uh, quotes and references and the names of scientists. And pretty much the whole book is just quotes um, by scientists. It's incredible. This one is unbelievable. I've thought about reading this one on, on, on a live stream at some point, but it would take us probably about 50 hours to get through it all. Uh, but that's a really good one to get hold of as well. Um, because you can just quote, you know, all these, all these materialistic sort of atheistic scientism worshipers, you can be like, well, you can quote their favorite scientists, uh, back at them saying that creationism is obviously the way it is <laughs> as opposed to the macroevolution thing well we uh you know the the universe was dead and then there was nothing there and nothing became everything and inert uh space dust became all complex life breaking the second law of thermodynamics it just doesn't make any sense <laughs> uh so yes Heidi this one is a big read I haven't read all of it but you don't need to. You just go to the section. I'll, I'll read a few of the... I'll, sh I'll, I'll give you a little preview of the contents because it's worth getting on a record. Zoom in. Uh, so the history of evolutionary theory. So the Big Bang, stellar evolution, the origin of the Earth, the age of the Earth, the problem of time, inaccurate dating methods, the primitive environment, uh, DNA and protein, natural selection, mutations, animal and plant species, fossils and strata, ancient man, effects of the flood. It's all, it's all, you know, solid stuff. Scientists speak, evolutionary scientists say the theory is unscientific and worthless. So that'd probably be a good section to look at. <laughs> Archaeological dating, evolution, morality and violence. That's a fantastic uh, section. Uh, yeah. And then a research guide if you if you need more after that. <laughs> okay. And this one was, uh, this one I heard, I first heard about on the Archaics channel. Archaics is here on YouTube, uh, really into books. Oh my gosh, what happened to my, oh no, it's okay. I thought it had all gone skew whiff there, but it looks like we're okay. So, it's a really good one to have. And uh, I got it, I think it was 10 quid when I got it. But it says here only $5 a copy. And I think there's instructions to order like a whole box of them so you can then sell them on at. Yeah, so here there's there's information on the back here about if you get a box full, it tells you how much and then you can sell each one of them for $5 and you know basically sell them at, at a profit. So it breaks all the numbers down on how you can do that there. But I don't know if this information is still active. I'm not sure, but... It's a good one to have, definitely. This is a real myth buster. <laughs> okay, that was a massive, long form intro. Probably the longest one I've ever done, but there was a lot to cram in there. Uh, so we should get right on with reading because I said we were going to do two chapters tonight, but it might get too late to do two chapters. So <laughs> maybe we'll just do one. So with all that said, 
we're getting we're carrying on tonight with Rockefeller Foundation, and we're gonna we we've got chapter eleven, which is the foundation enters new fields. It's a bit bright, isn't it? How does that look? Is that a little bit better? Um, yeah. So all these topics and all the things that we just covered are, are, are linked and they're mentioned. You've got the clownfish, but then you've got the funding, then you've got the allopathic medical paradigm, the germ theory, the terrain theory, all linked back to the theory of evolution, Charles Darwin, uh, via the way of Charles Galton Darwin and Francis Galton, the the book, The Next Million Years, uh, and then the setting up of these organizations, which have been running up to the present day, uh, funding people, pumping out scientists, indoctrinated into the specific worldview of, you know, kill or be killed, eat or be eaten, social Darwinism, basically. So big intro, but I think you'll agree, uh, hopefully, that it was uh, worth it. Is that light enough for everybody? That looks good. So let's read a chapter and then we'll see how we feel and whether or not we'll carry on with another one. So this is chapter 11. The foundation enters new fields. During the 20s, in addition to the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research, four Rockefeller boards were in active operation. The Rockefeller Foundation, the General Education Board, the International Education Board, and the Laura Spellman Rockefeller Memorial. And that Spellman uh, is mentioned in the video, the 15 minute video on BitChute that I'll link, that I will link underneath. Spellman. What is a Spellman? Someone who casts spells, right? And also it's, it's Spellman. Uh, but her first name is Laura. So it could be a little clue that there's a clownfish lurking around, swimming around the anemone. <laughs> Carrying on. Each of these boards was an independent corporation each with its own funds under its own trustees. The Rockefeller Foundation, as we have seen, was placing its major emphasis on public health and medical education. In addition to those two branches of its work, a division of studies had been created under Edwin R. Embry, to which were assigned several miscellaneous interests, including the training of nurses, aid to dispensaries, the human aspects of biology and anthropology. That the trustees did not consider themselves rigidly bound by the restrictions of a program is shown in such appropriations as were made to the Shakespeare Memorial Theatre in Stratford-on-Avon and for the purchase of the new site for the University of London. Okay, so the trustees <laughs> the trustees are funding uh, the Shakespeare Memorial Theatre. That's, that's quite curious. And also uh, buying new land for the for the University of London to the tune of uh, nearly two million dollars. Rule for the most part. Oh, hang on. But these, generally speaking, were exceptions to the rule, and the rule for the most part was medical education and public health. The General Education Board, in addition to its work in medical education in the United States, was engaged in promoting the effectiveness of the public school system, primarily in the South. It also was carrying on a program in the arts and the humanities. Moreover, under the leadership of Dr. Rose, who had resigned from the International Health Division to accept the presidency of the board in 1923, extensive support was being given to research in the physical and biological sciences at the university level. The International Education Board, which, as we have seen, was created by Mr. Rockefeller Jr. in 1923, owed its inception to Rose, who had been reluctant to assume the presidency of the General Education Board, with its charter limiting its operations to the United States, unless some way could be found by which he could carry his educational ideas overseas. In his work with the International Health Division, Rose had seen the effectiveness of ideas promulgated on an international scale, and he was accustomed to ranging the whole world as his parish. Yes, so there's, there is a link here. Uh, between th there's we we read in, in in Tuesday that they were trying to spread the gospel of public health, <laughs> uh, but it, we also read that in China they wanted to establish a university that was free of any kind of religion. So there's this kind of like get rid of organized religion and uh, you know poo poo that and then install this new religion of scientism. That's kind of the way I see it. 
but um, they, they did actually use people who were, um, you know, I think Baptists. I think there was a link between the Rockefellers and, and, and Baptists, but that's, that's something I've got to read more about and learn more about. Uh, but th certainly Frederick T. Gates, who's mentioned very early on in the book as a close confidant of uh, Rockefeller Sr., uh, he was definitely religious. I mean, uh, some sort of Christian flavor. But uh, yeah, he's he's seeing he's ranging the whole world as his parish, so we can see this like idea of kind of globalism and you know world order shining through there. The character of the General Education Board had been secured by Act of Congress, and it was thought that the creation of a new organization would involve less difficulty than an attempt to secure amendment. Through the instrumentality of this new board, therefore, Rose during the twenties was giving powerful impetus to the development of the physical and biological sciences, to agriculture, and to humanistic research. The Laura Spellman Rockefeller Memorial, founded in 1918 in memory of Mrs. Rockefeller Sr., had originally been planned with the idea of supporting projects and causes which had claimed her personal interest. When the funds at the disposal of the trustees exceeded these limited opportunities, a wider objective was sought in the welfare of women and children. Later, Larger sums given by Mr. Rockefeller to the memorial made even this objective too narrow, and in 1923, under the directorship of Beardley Rummel, the memorial embarked upon a broad plan to support research in the social sciences. 2. It was inevitable that these four foundations would encounter difficulties in their relationships with each other. Established at different times and for different purposes, they had developed various programs of activity often intimately related. At least, they were separated parts of or sections of a larger and more general program. These parts, however, were under the control of different sets of offices and different boards of trustees, and while the four boards worked together in an admirable spirit of cooperation, the more or less fortuitous distribution of programs unfortunately caused some degree of confusion, not only as between the boards themselves, but also in the public mind. For example... Medical education was divided geographically between the General Education Board and the Rockefeller Foundation. The natural sciences were found in the General Education Board, the International Education Board, and, in some aspects, the Rockefeller Foundation. The humanities and arts were dealt with by both the General Education Board and the Laura Spellman Rockefeller Memorial. The social sciences, while confined to the Laura Spellman Rockefeller Memorial, had certain bearings of upon the college and university policies of the General Education Board. Public health in its government relations was a function of the foundation, while the memorial in cooperating with private health agencies also had some relation to this field. The subject of mental hygiene lay in the field of both the foundation and the memorial. Agriculture and forestry were related to both the General Education Board and the International Education Board, although these organizations, because of identity of administrative personnel, worked with, without overlapping or duplication. It is axiomatic, said an advisor of Mr. Rockefeller, that if we were today considering the creation of machinery necessary to carry on certain general programs in medicine, health, education, and the other activities of the four Rockefeller boards, we would not, have set, we would not set up the rather confusing organization which we now have. End quote. And Mr. Rockefeller Sr. said in a letter to his son, dated 4th of May, 1926, quote, If the whole thing were to be done today, you have rightly understood me as feeling that it should be done, and doubtless could be done, through a single organization. End quote. After an extended study, a committee of trustees representing the four boards came to the conclusion that while a single organization might be ideally preferable, there were legal and other practical difficulties which seemed insurmountable. Said the committee, Considerations of tradition and established practice and the momentum of activities in actual operation must be given due weight, and we cannot build today as if nothing had happened, and we were erecting a completely new structure. The plan that was adopted in 1928, therefore, had as its core the idea that all the programs of the four Rockefeller boards relating to the advance of human knowledge should be concentrated in the Rockefeller Foundation. This involved transferring to the foundation the following activities. 
the Natural Sciences from the General Education Board and the International Education Board, the Social Sciences from the Memorial, the Humanities and Arts from the General Education Board, the Medical Sciences from the General Education Board, Agriculture and Forestry from the International Education Board and the General Education Board. To effect these transfers, the Laura Spellman Rockefeller Memorial was consolidated with the foundation, and while the International Education Board continued for a short time, its funds had largely been spent and it was soon wound up. This left two Rockefeller organizations in the field, exclusive of the Rockefeller Institute, i.e. the foundation and the General Education Board. And the new organization of the foundation included five divisions, the International Health Division, which was left untouched, and the divisions of the medical sciences, the natural sciences, the social sciences, and the humanities. Three. There remained the question whether a board of trustees could be constituted which was sufficiently qualified to pass on the merits of the projects in such widely sweeping fields. Was any single group competent to give judgment on the intricate questions involved, for example, in medicine and the humanistic studies? This, it will be remembered, was the identical question which Mr. Rockefeller Jr. had asked 20 years earlier in a letter to his father while the plan of the foundation was under consideration. Would it be possible, he had said, to get together a single group of men who could be expected to have knowledge and interest along so many different lines? It was on this point, too, that Gates later developed strong reservations and in his confidential autobiography, written probably in the early 20s, he said emphatically that he believed that the various parts of the Foundation's work, such as its activities in health and medicine, and perhaps others, might better have been incorporated and endowed independently. But the reorganization of 1928 was predicated, and in the author's opinion successfully predicated, on a different principle. It was the principle of the centralization of ultimate responsibility, combined with a marked decentralization in function. The problem was given searching study, and the solution lay along three lines. One, the Board of Trustees insisted on a thoroughly competent technical staff of officers for each of the five divisions of the Foundation's work. Officers of such caliber and chosen with such care that their recommendations to the trustees in their specialized fields would carry an initial weight of authority and responsibility. This principle had already been successfully demonstrated in health and medicine, and in Rose, Russell, Pierce and their associates and assistants, the trustees had had contact with judgment, competence and specialized knowledge upon which they could completely rely. The task now was to extend this same principle to the three new fields which had been added to the Foundation's operations. 2. In special areas covering complex operating functions, a board of scientific directors representing the best professional talent obtainable was interposed between the trustees and the officers, and the proposals and recommendations of the officers were screened through this new device. This occurred only in those areas where the foundation was engaged in direct field operations under its own management and control, i.e. in its public health work and in its later work in agriculture in Latin America. The boards of scientific directors were appointed by the trustees and met periodically. At all times, however, the ultimate control of function rested with the trustees. 3. Further to aid the trustees in their consideration of the proposals of the officers, an occasional specialist was added to the board. In principle, the Foundation's board is a lay board, and over the years in choosing trustees, emphasis has been placed on general ability, balance, level-headedness, and wide intellectual sympathies. The special contribution, however, which in the early days a trustee like Dr. Simon Flexner was able to make to the intelligent discussion of items in medicine brought the trustees to the realization that while a board composed exclusively of specialists would defeat its own purpose, an occasional specialist in a, f in a group of from 19 to 21 would add to the confidence of the trustees in their own judgments. The distinguished contributions of men like Dr. David L. Edsall, Dean of the Harvard Medical School, Dr. Alfred N. Richards of the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. George H. Whipple of Rochester, to mention three who are no longer connected with the board, 
more than justify the decision of the trustees to vary their pr general principle of choice. It was in this fashion, therefore, and with these administrative devices, that the Rockefeller Foundation assumed responsibility in 1928 for a far wider range of activity than had been earlier contemplated. Its work literally embraced the globe, and its branch offices in Paris, London, and the Far East reflected its augmented interests. Stego, its work literally embraced the globe. Although embrace might be the wrong kind of term. It might be more like ensnared, <laughs> imprisoned, you know, captured. I don't know. Four. The new program was defined in broad terms under the heading of the advance of knowledge, later redefined to include the dissemination and application of knowledge. This became the objective that the foundation was to follow for many years. There was a sense, therefore, in which 1928 marked a turning point in the thinking of the trustees. This was in part due to the fact that they had come to the end of an era in philanthropy, an era that was reflected in many other foundations as well. Huge sums had been spent in the endowment of medicine, public health institutes, and programs in higher education. Apart from the foundation's contributions, the General Education Board had given over $50 million on a matching basis to raise the endowments of American colleges and universities, and over $90 million for American medical schools. This type of giving could not continue without involving the rapid liquidation of the Rockefeller boards. Moreover, after the Depression of 1929, it became increasingly clear that the decline in interest rates and the mounting difficulty in inducing other donors to match foundation funds made appropriations for endowments an uncertain and dubious technique. The interest rates of 4 and 5%, which in the 20s and earlier could be confidently relied upon, were slashed to a point where perhaps double the amount of principal was required to maintain incomes of any fixed figure. And indeed, fixed figures grew increasingly unpredictable in terms of purchasing power. A new orientation of target, program and technique became, therefore, a vital necessity as the 20s drew to a close. The decision of the trustees to concentrate the work of the foundation on the extension of knowledge was based on a growing conviction that the margin between what men know and what they use is much too thin. Psychiatric institutes can be created a medical school strengthened, but as one professor expressed it, we haven't enough that we can confidently teach. Unless research is constantly maintained, the stockpile of knowledge becomes much too low for safety. There is a sense in which the practical applications of knowledge are the dividends which pure science declares from time to time. When pure science lags or is interrupted by a cataclysm like war, then it is necessary to pay these dividends out, out of surplus, and obviously this process cannot long continue. This, of course, was not an original idea, nor was it new as far as foundation practice was concerned. Although never so sharply defined before, the advance of knowledge had always enjoyed a conspicuous place in the organization's program. As we have seen, Pierce had made research an integral part of his medical strategy, and Russell, as head of the International Health Division, had breasted heavy opposition to establish the laboratory approach to fieldwork in public health. These influences were strongly marked in the thinking of the foundation, and they were given powerful support by Wycliffe Rose when he assumed the presidency of the General Education Board and the International Education Board in 1923. Rose brought to his new posts a profound conviction that human progress in the long run is dependent upon the extension of knowledge although in his early days with the International Health Division, this conviction had not been pronounced. But somewhere along the road, he had seen a new light. Quote, All important fields of activity, he now said, from the breeding of bees to the administration of an empire, call for an understanding of the spirit and technique of modern science. Science is the method of knowledge. It is the key to such dominion as man may ever exercise over his physical environment. Appreciation of its spirit and technique, moreover, determines the mental attitude of a people, affects the entire system of education, and carries with it the shaping of a civilization. So what stands out to me about that quote is that he says, from the breeding of bees to the administration of an empire. Do you think that's an accident? Um, 
I think I spoke on a previous live stream about they want to make a sort of hive society where the majority are expendable workers and drones that, that can be replaced easily and can be worked to death, you know, uh, for the benefit of the queen of the ant colony or the queen bee of the beehive. And so I don't think it's any accident that the uh, that this is used here, this example of breeding bees to the administration of an empire is clearly drawing a parallel between the two. And, you know, I was saying in a chat with uh, somebody in my telegram that here in, in, in England, that we have my, the, the company I work for has a HR system, which lists all the personnel in the, in the organization and all our qualifications and areas of work and experience and this kind of thing. And it's, they called, they literally called it the hive. <laughs> And when they rolled it out, I was thinking like, am I the only person that feels like deeply insulted by this? You know, just, they're just sticking us all in this program called the hive as though we are drones and workers that can be, you know, replaced and, and aren't just, it was so blatant and on the nose that I was shocked they did it, but there it is. But then also you have in Manchester here in Lancashire in the Northwest of England, or, or it's technically not in Lancashire, but it's next to Lancashire. Um, the, the symbol of the city is the bee. You know, and and it's everywhere. It's on all cafes and walls and graffiti and it, it's it's buses. It's the bee and they're really proud. And we're at Manchester and we're all bees. <laughs> and it's like you do understand what a, what structure a hive a beehive takes, right? <laughs> don't you? Uh, yeah. And Peter says worker bees who don't own anything. Yeah. And Selena Selena Selene. I don't know why I'm struggling to pronounce this. I apologize. I'll call you Lion. Senelion, Selenelion, Selenelion says the globe is literally the prison. Yeah, it is like that. It's like a prison planet, isn't it? So, um, and then thank you for sharing that quote by John D. Rockefeller, Selenelion. I don't want a nation of thinkers. I want a nation of worker bees. He didn't say worker bees. He just said workers. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know the source for that quote, but I have seen it being uh, passed around before and it wouldn't surprise me at all if he did say that. It is true that Rose was interested largely in the national sci uh, natural sciences. He was not too confident that any direct approach could be made through ordered knowledge to the intricate problems of social control. He looked with some misgiving upon Rummel's attempt to stimulate basic research in economics and sociology through Laura Spellman Rockefeller Memorial. Supremely confident of the interrelation of knowledge, he believed that the development of mathematics, physics, and chemistry, where precision and laboratory experiment are definitely established, was the best contribution. Now, this to me is funny because he's, he's on about the development of mathematics, physics, and chemistry. Well, the, the, the trivium and quadrivium existed for a long, 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 long time. The quadrivium being, uh, you know, the trivium is is, 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 is is grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And then the quadrivium is number number in time, number in space, and number in space and time, which which translated to, you know, school subjects would be maths, uh, music, geometry, and I'm not sure about geometry, but maths, music is two of them. Number in space, I think, is geometry. And then number in space and time is is like astronomy. I'm, I'm butchering that, you know, but I'm, I'm not an expert in these things. But my point is, that these things existed, uh, and I think, you know, physics, chemistry, and mathematics were very well developed and very well understood by plenty of different cultures and ancient uh, thinkers. And, and uh, so it's this idea that, oh, it took, it took this massive investment in science to bring us out of some kind of ignorant dark ages where we were just banging rocks together and, you know, picking our noses and not getting anything done. <laughs> But I think we actually, there were places and cultures that had very deep grasps of these topics and concepts. Uh, okay. Oh, I was halfway through a sentence there. So what he said, he believed that the development of mathematics, physics, and chemistry, where precision and laboratory experiment are definitely established, was the best contribution that could be made to what he reluctantly called the social sciences. He almost seemed to feel that there was some process of osmosis 
by which the aims and something of the mood of the fundamental sciences would by diffusion be transferred to problems of social control. It was characteristic of his intellectual honesty that he was the one man in all the Rockefeller group who opposed the reorganizations of 1928. That year, however, he reached the retirement age and he left the organization with the veneration and affection of his colleagues. Vincent retired the following year and his departure was equally lamented. New faces and new leadership took over the management. Dr. Max Mason, who succeeded Vincent as president, spoke for the trustees when he said, I just need to take a swig, excuse me. When he said, The advance of knowledge is the sailing direction given the officers by the board. We would like to feel that not too great rigidity is implied. In fundamental facts, there must be research in the narrow sense. But the advancement of knowledge demands also an interest in educational processes, and in many cases the demonstration or application of existing fundamental knowledge. Knowledge is gained by applying it, and sanity and value are thus brought to research. End quote. So this whole thing about like advance ad, the advancement of knowledge is in and of itself the goal. Okay. That that seems incomplete to me because you might want, you know, for example, hopefully you don't know uh, the, 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 the limit, the limits of physical torture that your uh, bus driver can endure, right? You don't know. That's a piece of knowledge you do not have. You know, according to this kind of philosophy, well, getting that piece of knowledge is a good thing because we don't have it. So if we can get that knowledge, then that is a worthwhile thing to pursue and go after. Yeah. So the the my point is that the pursuit of knowledge in and of itself on its own when not tempered by morality or ethics or or um an intention to do good or to be benevolent is not enough. Then there needs to be more uh packaged in with that. Uh, but they're not mentioning it or talking about it at all in this book. It's just like knowledge, knowledge, more knowledge. Let's get more knowledge. Like like they're addicted to it, like they're knowledge junkies or something. <laughs> that's that's kind of my reading of it. What do you think? It was Mason too who emphasized the structural unity involved in the new orientation of program. It was not to be five programs, each represented by a division of the foundation. It was to be essentially one program directed to the general problem of human behavior with the aim of control through understanding. Okay, okay. <laughs> Did I just read that right? It was not to be five programs, each represented by a division of the foundation. It was to be essentially one program directed to the general problem of human behavior with the aim of control through understanding. I'm just going to... Make a little, that's quite a revealing quote. So I just want to put a little pencil note next to it and I'm going to put one of these little sticky tabs on that page as well. Because it's actually, uh, when I read books, I tend to, you know, annotate them and put these little sticky tabs all the way through uh, so I can get back to the juicy bits and find the good quotes and the nuggets again. When I'm reading live, I don't want to interrupt the flow of the reading by stopping all the time to, to make notes and put these little very manly pink tabs <laughs> in the pages. But if you have a look at other books I've done, uh, so I, I did a long form review of this on the channel, which is uh, IBM and the Holocaust. And you see all the tabs that I put in there. This is a massive book. So that's usually what I do when I'm reading, you know, when I'm not reading live and I'm just reading on my own. And that was my plan before I started doing these live readings. But uh, that bit was just too juicy to not have to pause and mark because I'm going to have to come back to that and quote it again. But there it is right there. So this is these, these are the guys who took over the first generation because uh, we had Vincent. He resigned. Great guy. Pat on the back. Everyone was sad. Everyone was lamenting that he moved on. Mason shows up, Dr. Max Mason, and he's like, one problem, general problem. The problem is the behavior of the humans and we need to control it. <laughs> I 
So, so let's get some knowledge about how to control human behavior. Well, uh, this was the essential goal of the reorganization of 1928, redefined and reinterpreted over the years in the light of new experience and reshaped in some of its outlines by the necessities of the Second World War. It has served over two decades in giving to the general purpose of the foundation, as stated in its charter, the meaning and significance which the times seemed to call for. Five. Throughout this period, however, the trustees were always aware that research, which was the technical tool of the new program, could, in some fields at least, become sterile. They wanted to be sure that facts were tested by practical application. Some of them felt that under the impetus of the scientific method, scholarship was inclined to become over-interested in the collection of facts for their own sake and under-interested in the problem of the philosophy implied by the facts. Those trustees wanted... So hang on, that was, that was uh, saying that some, some of the trustees were worried about that, right? Yeah. So some of them had the concern that I just laid out where, you know, pursuing facts and knowledge f- for the sake of pursuing it could take you down to some very dark places. And some of them are saying, wait, hang on a second, just, just collecting facts and going after knowledge... Uh, what about the philosophy that is implied? Um, let's see. They're probably going to get kicked out of the foundation. <laughs> Those trustees wanted to be certain that the foundation did not lose sight of what Professor Whitehead called totality of vision, a capacity for synthesis and integration, an ability not only to enumerate and describe, but to evaluate. In a letter to one of the officers, the president of a prominent college expressed the opinion that nine-tenths of the money that foundations spent for research did not come to grips with public need. Ooh, that's interesting, isn't it? The president of a prominent college said that, nine-tenths of the money. This fraction, of course, was a guess on his part, but some of the trustees were uneasy, and one of their committees reported its opinion that, quote, large amounts of money are spent by foundations and universities alike on research projects that are unrealistic, unproductive, and often unrelated to human aspiration or need. Ain't that the truth? And let's, let's actually look up the quote for that one. So that's, that's footnote number four. This is chapter 11. The foundation enters new fields. Uh, where are the footnotes? Uh, so that uh, just says, oh, that's a really boring. It just says a report, report on, of committee on appraisal and review. So... Not very revealing there. I thought it was going to give me a uh, you know reference to a new book that I could buy, but you win some, you lose some. Another question that was raised by the trustees as the third decade of the century grew ominously black was whether the civilization which we are building can utilize the knowledge which it has. The growth of propaganda as an instrument of education, the rise of dictatorships, the arbitrary challenge to democracy as a method of social control. It was a phenomena of this type which gave pause to those who believed that the primary need of our age was more knowledge. Yeah, interesting. Very good. I'm kind of uh, in agreement with these people who are asking that question. It is interesting to note how often, during this period, the trustees gave expression to this doubt. What special branches of knowledge should be enlarged, they asked. Is all knowledge equally important? Is anybody wise enough to determine the relative significance of different types of knowledge in a social order struggling for equilibrium? In 1934, a committee of trustees appointed to survey the work of the foundation made this comment, quote, The end of knowledge is, among other things, the better understanding of the world. That goal will not be reached by the mere multiplication of men able to collect more facts, but by the increase of those who know, first, what facts ought to be collected, and, second, what value those facts have when assembled. The possession of funds carries with it power to establish trends and styles of intellectual endeavor. Yes. With the best will in the world, the trustees of a foundation may select unwisely. Yeah, in the case of uh, Kinsey, for example, that was a bit of an unwise selection or place emphasis where it should not be placed or initiate movements which serve only to close men's eyes to more promising avenues. 
To guard against these evils requires critical judgment, common sense, wide understanding and eternal vigilance. In making this comment, we would say again that we are by no means suggesting that research be omitted from the Foundation's activities. We assume that the trustees will continue to be interested in explorations in the various fields of knowledge and research will continue to be an effective weapon. Well, that would be a good footnote to look up as well. But yeah, I, I agree with those points. That's that's the kind of that's the kind of line of thinking that I'm 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 considering when I'm, as I'm reading this. The doubt was never entirely resolved. Oh, what a surprise! <laughs> And the question was never completely answered. Huh. Well, it was agreed that vigilance was necessary. And a dozen years later, the author of this history, who had succeeded Mason as president in 1936, undoubtedly voiced the opinion of the trustees when he wrote in the annual review, quote, so this is Fosdick quoting himself. Yeah, uh, it's a bit confusing, but he says, uh, the author of this history, so he means this history as in this book and the author of it, which is him. He said, quote, the answer does not lie in trying to curb science or fix boundaries beyond which intellectual adventure shall not be allowed to go. So there you go. If, 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 uh, if you don't know what the limits, the limits of physical torment that your bus driver can endure, then you got to kidnap him and find out because knowledge in it facts facts bro we need more facts and uh, no no boundaries or limits to that <laughs> such a course even if it could succeed would return us to an animal existence in which mere survival was the only goal so this this here is showing you the uh the darwinism you know because he's 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 his presupposition is that we came from some kind of animal existence uh and that we'll go back to it if we don't find out you know, as much knowledge as we possibly can and have no limits or boundaries on the the um, acquisition of knowledge and, and facts and information and data and statistics. Um, the search for truth is, as it always has been, the noblest expression of the human spirit. That sentence I agree with. Man's hunger for knowledge about himself, his environment and the forces by which he is surrounded gives human life its meaning and purpose and clothes it with final dignity. Okay. You know, so it's kind of like, in my, I agree with like half of that, but the first half, I'm, no, I'm, I don't really agree with that. It was this point of view that unmistakably underlay the thinking of the trustees in the two decades following the reorganization of 1928. That is the end of that chapter. So, where's my bookmark? I enjoyed that one. We found, actually, I should probably mark that last page up because... Well, so he's say so he's saying the uh, do not try to curb science and do not fix any boundaries beyond which intellectual adventure is not allowed to go is, is is exactly what he said. So that to me sounds like well, if you need to roll out some sort of experimental procedure that is administered through a needle uh, on an unsuspecting population to find out you know what it does and how to improve it and how to get an, uh, how we can you know use it develop it to make it better, then you can do that. Because we, it's very important that we don't have any boundaries, or uh, we don't have, we don't curb science. That's what it sounds like to me. So we'll have a little uh, pause there and, and look back at the uh, quote, uh, the chats. Kind of a dry uh, paragraph. Uh, sent. Oh my God, I can't even speak. Kind of a dry chapter. Uh, particularly with all the reorganization and oh, there was this bit and that merged with that bit and they, they all right, whatever, but all that corporate stuff always goes way over my head and I find it really struggle to, to care. Uh, but I did appreciate that they wanted to, they, they said it, ultimately they centralized the, they basically centralized the authority, didn't they, of the whole thing? Because it, it started off as five different uh, corporations with five different, boards and set of trustees so basically there's five corporations on the go and it was like mm, no we need to consolidate all this and get it under one board of trustees uh, and under one one group of him one group who are controlling it and influencing it basically and that's kind of what we're talking about and learning about on this channel with regards to the one globe the one earth the one world uh government 
that's exactly what Bertrand Russell and H.G. Wells were talking about in their books that we read on this channel anyway. Uh, but what do you out there listening to this live think about that chapter? I'll just have a sip. All right, so first things first, I got to get a pronunciation lesson on how to say Celine Lyon. Oh, okay. Celine Lyon. Hope that makes it easier. Yeah, it does make it easier. Yeah, Celine Lyon. Yeah, I was getting all messed up there. Sorry about that. Celine Dion esque. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, Celine Dion esque. Celine Lyon. Okay, got it. Celine Lyon. Really good to have you here. I'm sorry it took me so long to get your name right. <laughs> um, Heidi says the, bi the biggest biblical misunderstanding using dominion instead of stewardship for our relationship to the world around us. Yeah, that, does that happen a lot? So, this, yeah, so there's kind of this there's this one view which is we're here to to care for and look after and protect and and be stewards be like caretakers or be the be the ones who protect and nurture and love and and grow and encourage and and foster the development of the natural world and then there's the other view that we're here to just dominate and pillage and and uh dig it up and put it to use and and bend it to our will and control it right so I think that's what you're getting at there. And that's, I didn't, that's interesting that it's a biblical misunderstanding. That would make sense. Uh, and that goes back to what I was saying uh, about the survival of the fittest and the Darwinian, social Darwinism, which is kind of what we find ourselves under and, and what the, you know, the, the sort of the long-term planning of the likes of the eugenicists and the uh, scientific elite, the technocratic type of people, the people who want to just push scientism at all costs. They believe in might makes right. They believe in, you know, survival of the fittest, dog eats dog. Uh, whereas, you know, most of us people, normal people, not that normal has any meaning, but I mean, just people living their life, going to work, paying the bills, raising their family. We, we tend to collaborate and cooperate. You know, it always blows my mind that you go to a city and you've got millions of people wandering around and everyone's basically just getting on, going about their own business. You know, you see a bit of crazy stuff every now and again and you see more crazy stuff nowadays than, you know, 20 years ago or or however many years before that you might have been around. But for the most part, everyone just goes about their business and, and, and you know, helps each other out. You hold open a door, pick a thing up if someone's dropped it on the whole, we're collaborating and cooperating and, and being, you know, uh, communal in that sense. Um, William Kareen, the only thing novel about modern hard sciences is the absence of metaphysics. That is a, that is a nail that you have just smashed on the head. <laughs> and that, 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 that conversation around metaphysics was what, uh, I learned. I started learning about at least from Jay Dyer, uh, it, which is what led me to begin praying, which is part of what led me to to start praying again, was was listening to a lot of, I went through a Jay Dyer phase and I was just like everything. It was around the Pay Piggy time where he, if anyone is a Jay Dyer fan, there was a time when he record, he made a song called Pay Piggy. And it is a, is one of the strangely catchiest tunes, you know? <laughs> and uh, and I was just, I was listening to so much Jay Dyer and because he's got the film stuff, like commenting on films, but then the geopolitical, then the espionage, uh, and then also, you know, the, the the theology and the history of religion and, and his orthodox Christian perspective. Um, and I got into the transcendental argument for God, and then I got into, oh yeah, metaphysics, and the presuppositional critique of different arguments. And I'm like, oh, this all this makes a lot of sense. And then, and then I'm like, okay, I better, I'm going to start praying and see what happens. And then, yeah, you know. I mean, I like I that all all that little story I just gave you was was all happened before I even started making videos. You know, it, that came later on. Like I started praying and had lots of different reflections on my life, what I was doing, where I was going, what I could do to be of service to other people. You know, and I realized that oh, I've been collecting all these books and they're just sitting there, and I'm reading them, but it's a bit selfish if I just read them and I don't share that information and knowledge with other people. And then I'm like, hmm, I bet other people would actually want to know what's in these books. <laughs> Maybe I could, uh, you know, do a service and create content to, to, to give that information out to people who don't have the time or the access or the energy to read the books themselves. So that was kind of a little, little, uh, insight into my own journey. And it started with, as you said, uh, William, that, that 
realization of metaphysics. Oh, that's a thing that exists. That's real. And it's totally absent from this worldview that I've grown up with and been given at school and been indoctrinated with. And what happens if we put it back in? Uh, oh, oh, right. Okay. Now I'm, and uh, boom, life just took a whole different route, which I'm extremely grateful for, you know. Heidi says, yeah, control. So that quote about control is very revealing. And you're, yeah, and I thought you might mention this, the, the Gnosticism. So Gnostic, Gnosticism comes from knowledge, doesn't it? Uh, gnosis, knowledge, Gnosticism. And uh, I know that there's a, 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 a tension between Gnosticism and Orthodox Christianity in particular. And, and all the Gnostic positions were debated and, and refuted back in the early days of the Christian church of the Orthodox Christian church by the church fathers. I haven't read any of that and I don't delve into any of that stuff. I don't know about it, but Jay Dyer is your man. If you want to know that stuff, uh, I, I actually, you know, I'm, I don't know where I stand on all that stuff, but cause I like learning and I love going after knowledge, but obviously like in the example I used before, which was kind of a silly example, but you get my drift that like, there's some knowledge you just don't need to know, you know, you don't need to know like, how many, how many, how much of a human body can you cut off it before, before it dies? You know, these gross, terrible things, you know, or like the Kinsey stuff, the stuff that he was trying to learn and know about. You don't need to know that, you know, how, how many orgasms kind of young, uh, you know, human being, have. all, all the, ugh, it, I don't even want to say it. It just makes me cringe. It's horrible. So the, so I do agree the knowledge and going after knowledge is a good thing because I enjoy reading and learning. But then at the same time, it does need to have some sort of boundaries and restrictions. Uh, otherwise, horrific stuff happens. And I think we're, you know, to speak to our current predicament, we're kind of heading, barreling into this era of, the, of like the knowledge that's being collected about us at all times. And we're just giving it up voluntarily. Uh, particularly young people, very, very sinister, very creepy, and they don't realize that they have no privacy. They're not going to ever know what it's like to have had privacy. Uh, and then and then the next generation will just be like, well, we just don't have privacy. It's just, and then we're in 1984 territory. We're in, um, Yevgeny Zamyatin wrote a book called We, and in that book, everyone lives in apartments and all the walls are glass. So at all times, you can see into everybody else's apartment. And the whole thing is privacy. But if you're born into a world without privacy, you will never know. You know, they'll probably gradually delete the word privacy from the language and people aren't saying it anymore, which means they forget that it was ever a thing. And then they'll just lose the ability to even imagine what privacy is. And 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 they won't be able to recognize that they no longer have it because they won't have a word for it or a concept in their mind that that describes that. So I think that's kind of uh, where we're heading. And, and that unmitigated, untempered desire to, to get more knowledge and to know more information as described so eloquently by Mr. Fosdick here, incredibly dangerous and re very revela rev revelatory about this like scientific, atheistic, materialistic, technocratic mindset that's driving uh, a lot of the agendas and the things that we're experiencing and living through. All right, what else we got? Peter says, it's important for the record though, paperwork trails, follow the money, good detail stuff. And even stewardship has its shortcomings, judicial system being maritime law and economics with a focus on economics. Yeah, the maritime law, common law, the laws of the contracting, that all stuff, all that stuff is really, really interesting, but I'm a bit too far behind the curve to comment on it with any... I don't have anything intelligent to say about it at this point. Apart from the fact that the language is really key to know what the words actually mean, what they mean in certain contexts and circumstances, what legalese is as, of, as opposed to English. In fact, I was in, if anyone watching this or hearing this is in Manchester, there's an Oxfam and it's in Charlton Cum Hardy and it's a book and CD shop. It's just books and CDs. And in there, they've got an English dictionary it's from like the 17, 1780 or 1790 and it's an etymological dictionary and it's like 250 quid and I didn't have 250 quid on me. Surprise, surprise <laughs> to buy it today. But oh boy, would I like to get in there and, you know, read some of the etymology and the words and the meanings. Uh, but 1790, that might be so far back that actually none of it makes sense to me. <laughs> uh 
Okay. Looking good. William says, this video has been of service to me. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I'm extremely glad you're here. Uh... Something I'm not going to mention about chickens. <laughs> um, all right. We've got some lively conversation here. and I appreciate that. And that's what it's all about. It's about uh, being excellent to each other, uh, sharing ideas, offering opinions, um, and having, an, uh, having, having a back and forth. You know, um, who was talking about pubs? Somebody was talking about pubs. And they were saying that they used to go down the pub I think it was Nigel Watson maybe in, in a recent interview and he, he was saying like before phones, he would go down the pub and his mates would sit around and you would all like argue and debate and discuss things. Not argue, but you would debate things and you would get heated and you would try and work out the truth of a matter because that's what you were there for. You were there to sit and talk and, and exchange ideas and you would have a point of view and they would have a point of view and you would, you would kind of like exchange that and try and come to some understanding or agreement, you know, and we've kind of lost that in many ways. We've lost the ability to tolerate being around people who think differently to ourselves. Um, so it's really good uh, to have this like forum and format of just like open, honest exchange of information and always showing respect and always recognizing that every person you ever meet has something for you to learn. They know something you don't know. And so that's, a, I think that's a Jordan Peterson thing. You know, everyone you meet has, has knows something that you don't know. So every, every conversation exchange is, is a, is an opportunity to, to learn. And so it's a really good way to look at it. Um, William says, William says, buy that dictionary. That is actually something I wanted to uh, say is there is, um, ways to support the show all in the description box, un box underneath the video and all donations that are coming in, uh, are all going to, uh, improve the, the, the production. So for example, this thing here, I bought this thanks to donations. Uh, I got the book cam prior to, I didn't have the book cam. It was just me talking and holding up books. Now I got a book cam. We can read books together. Uh, I recently got this, this little package. And this is, let me show you. This is a Raspberry Pi five, tiny little gadget. It's, it's actually a computer. Okay. And that is going to be a home server. I got, a, I got a good, knowledgeable, uh, super nerd friend who's going to help me set that up. And that's going to be a home server on which we're going to have uh, the host. We're going to host uh, the audio of my work and we're going to have a uh, chat in there that's, that's going to be private uh, and maybe even a website as well. So I'm kind of investing in the in the show and the infrastructure and the back end stuff here uh, with all the donations. But I'm also buying a lot of books. <laughs> so if you've got a book you want me to buy, um, then tip in the jar uh, and I will grab hold of that and we can read it together and study it together. So um, yeah, that that is how I would be able to, or I got to wait till next payday, which is quite a while off because I get paid at the end of every month. So, <laughs> so yeah, but uh, I will definitely, if, if, if it can happen and we can make it happen, I'll be going back there. So I hope no one else grabs it before me. So I'm just going to have another swig and then we can do another chapter because it's Friday night. No, it's not. It's Saturday night. But that means most of us get a lie in unless you're getting up early for church, in which case, good for you. You should be doing that too. But let's see. I shouldn't really look ahead to see how long the chapter is, should I? But ah, the next, oh, the, we got chapter. So this, we'll do chapter 12 now because the one after this, chapter 13, check out, Check out chapter 13. Experimental biology. Oh, that's going to be a good one. You know it, don't you? But we're not there yet. We're on, nat we're on natural sciences, chapter 12. So let's crack on. We'll get this one done. See what's going on here. And uh, then we'll call it a night, I think, because it is actually getting on. This is, this is a long one. So thank you all for hanging in there and sticking it out. I hope it has been useful and informative. But there's, there is always the replay. This channel isn't getting nuked yet and I haven't had any strikes or videos deleted or removed yet. Uh, but I am recording them and I am going to be putting them up elsewhere. Uh, so, But for now, YouTube is, you can still go and get the replays if you need to get to, to get to sleep, get some beauty sleep or something like that. I understand. I won't, there won't be any hurt feelings, but let's do chapter 12. The Natural Sciences. 
One outcome of the reorganization of 1928 was the establishment of a natural sciences division, and thereafter the promotion of fundamental science became a primary concern of the Rockefeller Foundation, coordinate with its interest in public health, the medical, the, the medical sciences, the social sciences, and the humanities. Got a little footnote. The trustees attempted to avoid divisional demarcations by passing a resolution that directors be appointed for groups of subjects rather than for specific fields like natural sciences, social sciences, etc. It was a well-intentioned gesture which had no effect. In turning its attention to this broad area of human endeavour, the foundation was not entering unfamiliar fields. Indeed, the creation of the divisional organisation in 1928 simply systematised and extended an interest that already had been active for a number of years, first in a tentative way in the Rockefeller Foundation itself and later in the General Education Board and the International Education Board. The present programme resulted from bringing together these three earlier streams. The interest of the foundation in the natural sciences seems to have derived from its early concern with health and medicine. Shortly after the First World War, Dr. Simon Flexner of the Rockefeller Institute, who was also a trustee of the foundation, began to express his growing concern of the lack of an adequate background in physics and chemistry among medical researchers. The physical sciences, and he stressed mathematics as well as physics and chemistry, are so intimately related to the advance of medicine that no organization concerned with the latter can neglect the former. His first idea was the establishment of an institute for research in physics and chemistry, analogous to the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research. After considerable study, this area was abandoned, and in its place a proposal made by the National Research Council in Washington was adopted. This council which had been set up during the war to make the services of American scientists available to the government, represented all branches of science, and its membership included the nation's leading investigators and research directors. They now came forward with the suggestion that the most critical need was the recruitment and training of an adequate succession of young scientists, versed in the techniques and standards of modern research. It was thereupon jointly decided to offer a stated number of annual fellowships, the Rockefeller Foundation to provide the funds, the National Research Council to select the fellows and administer the program. The outcome of this decision was the launching of the National Research Fellowships, and that event in 1919 marks the beginning of foundation aid to the natural sciences. Thirteen fellowships were awarded the first year, six in physics and seven in chemistry. The 19, in 1923, the scope of the fellowships was broadened to include mathematics and biology as well, and later astronomy, geology and geography were added. Although it was started immediately after the First World War, there has never been any interruption of foundation support of the National Research Fellowships, and they have continued as a consistent backdrop to all other activities in the natural sciences. So I've mentioned uh, earlier this week that these kind of fellowships, um, I think these, these national research fellowships are very similar to the uh, Rhodes Scholarships. So where the Rhodes Scholarships will be getting people to train them in like economics and uh, politics and political leadership and uh, history and um, the writing of history according to what they want us to think and know and, and believe. Uh, it sounds like the National Research Fellowships are doing the same, but in, in instead of in the sort of, uh, you know, the realms of history and politics and, and arts, the these these fellowships are doing it in the realm of, of the sciences, uh, physics, chemistry, and that kind of thing, mathematics too. By 1950, a total of 1,107 persons have been trained under these fellowships and the appropriations for support of the program over the 32 years had mounted to more than $4 million. Footnote, these fellowships are not to be confused with the National Research Council Fellowships in Medicine established by the foundation and mentioned in Chapter 8. Ah, okay. So that's probably, uh, so there's multiple versions and, and forms of these fellowships that they're, they're funding Today, former fellows occupy top positions in the faculties of the leading universities. Others are key men in government-supported research, and three have received Nobel Prizes. In his autobiography, Robert A. Millikan, 
who was one of the early advisors and architects of the National Research Fellowship Program, characterizes it as, quote, the most effective agency in the scientific development of American life and civilization that has appeared on the American scene in my lifetime, and as the most vital influence in the development of the United States into a country whose scientific output is now comparable to that of other leading scientific countries. This auspicious beginning was not immediately followed by any systematic development of the field of the natural sciences, such as Rose was inaugurating in public health and Pierce was later to inaugurate in medicine. Gates was interested in the field only as it related to medicine, and President Vincent was at heart too much of a humanist to be deeply concerned. However, it was due to Vincent that the foundation made a grant of half a million dollars to the Marine Biological Laboratory at Woods Hole, which remains today one of the world's chief centers of biological research. Following this came another grant, $756,000, to finance biological abstracts for 10 years, a bit of pioneering that was to result in one of the most useful bibliographical tools of science. But apart from a few minor grants in biology, the field was not further developed. Vincent's regime was committed to medicine and public health, and deviations from program were the exception rather than the rule. 2. The transfer of Wycliffe Rose in 1923 from the International Health Division to the leadership of the General Education Board and the newly created International Education Board furnished another and conclusive reason why the foundation should not then move into the field of the natural sciences. For Rose moved into it with all his characteristic vigor and enthusiasm, preempting the natural sciences as far as the Rockefeller boards were concerned, and staking out a claim that would have discouraged the foundation even if it had had any special interest in the area. Within a few weeks after assuming the presidency of both boards, he produced for his own guidance a comprehensive summary of his ideas under the title A Scheme for the Promotion of Education on an International Scale. He made it clear, however, that he was not thinking of education in the conventional pedagogical... Pedagogical... <laughs> pedagogical... I can't say it. That's it. I've hit my limit. Two hours seems to be my limit. Pedagogical sense not the routine of instruction of youth and adults through schools, colleges, extension courses and lectures. Such undertakings could be left to the governments and private agencies already concerned with them. What concerned him was that the International Education Board should be useful in fields of educational activity that may be regarded as germinal. And by this he meant the fostering of education in its twin roles of discovery the increase of knowledge, and diffusion, the extension of knowledge among mankind. Guided by this principle, the International Education Board selected two areas as its principal fields of interest, the natural sciences, sciences and agriculture. Actually, of course, agriculture is directly dependent on the natural sciences. Indeed, it may be defined as the application of botany, biochemistry, biophysics, genetics, and related specialties to plant improvement and production. Thus, in a quite literal sense, Rose was focusing the whole program in the direction of the natural sciences. Promotion of the development of science in a country is germinal, he declared. It affects the entire system of education and carries with it the remaking of a civilization. But, he observed, the nations now cultivating the sciences are but a small minority of the peoples of the world, and he concluded that it should be feasible to extend the field for the cultivation and the services of science almost indefinitely. But how should the board proceed? Rose wrote down his guiding principles in these words, quote, Begin with physics, chemistry, and biology. Locate the inspiring productive men in each of these fields. Ascertain of each of these whether he would be willing to train students from other countries, if so, ascertain how many he could take on at one time. Provide the equipment needed, if any, by operation on the scale desired. Provide by means of fellowships for the international migration of select students to each of these centers of inspiration and training. Students to be carefully selected and to be trained with reference to definitive service in their own countries after completion of their studies. This scheme became the dominating interest in Rose's life. 
The program and staff of the General Education Board were, for the moment, deeply involved in their medical and southern interests, and so he was able to devote the major part of his time to getting the International Education Board established on its course. Toward the end of 1923, he left for Europe on a tour that occupied five months and took him to 50 universities and other research institutions in 19 countries. In each, he sought out the leading scientists, usually calling on them in their laboratories, where he was able to meet their staffs, see their equipment, and inquire into their problems. It was an extraordinary and heartening experience for these European scientists. Just emerged from the war, many of them still suffering from its privations, to have this profit of education on an international scale come with his understanding, solicitation and offer of help. So again, profit, they're, they're co-opting and using this uh, religious language in order to well just give away the fact that they're just indoctrinating people in scientism and sending them back to their countries to, to push it and spread it there. But yeah, the, the profit of education. Ground harrowed by the war, rose called Europe, ready for new seed. Now, let me just uh, clear my throat and have a sip. This idea that the war uh, was ground, harrowed by the war, ready for new seed is very interesting to me because when you actually look into uh, the origins of the First World War, uh, with books like uh, The Hidden History by uh, Doherty and McGregor uh, and Lord Milner's Second War by John Caffergy. W when you find out that it was like literally a conspiracy <laughs> and uh, to, uh, this this metaphor is, is a little more poignant because you realize that that is kind of, maybe that was actually part of it. Let's Let's get rid of a whole, you know, out with the old and in with the new. Let's take out all the young men of fighting age who, who have this willingness to die for their country because they're so invested in the tradition and the culture and, and they have the sense of national belonging and they want to protect their loved ones, the women and the children, the elderly, and they're willing to put their lives on the line. Let's, let's get rid of that because they're, they're the ones who will get in the way of our plans. So if we run a couple of wars, just, just hobble the generation, you know, the the um, this generation, and then have a load of new children, and then we've got them by the short and curlies because they're going through the the indoctrination system with a completely new set of values, with this new like the introduction of these globalist values and these these atheistic, scientific, materialistic worldviews, right? And so it's just poignant to me that he used that image there of ground harrowed by the war, ready for new seed. It, it takes on a, a different kind of resonance when you reflect on the fact that, oh, maybe that actually was part of the intention of running that whole thing and, and, and allowing, you know, two of them to happen. It's get rid of people and then we can advance our plans. Because if we were trying to advance them while all these young men of fighting age were around, they might all get together and organize and, and you know, stop, stop getting in the way of our plans. This day and age, they kind of... <laughs> They've cut in certain places in the world anyway. They kind of got rid and softened and weakened due to all the clownfish antics. The 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 clownfish industrial complex, you know, is is literally like. Can you imagine any of these people going to fight a war <laughs> or standing up for anything other than their right to be, you know, mauled by the state chemically and uh, and have that paid for by the taxpayer? <laughs> it's, yeah, I don't know why, but that 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 particular um, metaphor there just really really stood out to me. He also conferred with government scientists and officials on the needs in agriculture and the idea of a cooperative program to assist and extend education in scientific agriculture won many favorable responses. When Rose returned to New York, he had established working relations in eighteen European countries and had prospects for cooperation in four others. He proceeded to organize a staff, borrowing from Princeton its professor of physics, Augustus Trowbridge, to serve as director for the natural sciences and from Cornell, its dean of the College of Agriculture, Albert R. Mann, to serve as director for agriculture. Before the end of 1924, the program was rapidly moving into action. Even earlier, 
While Rose was still in Europe, applicants for fellowships were appraised and the first appointments made. Trowbridge established an office in Paris and it immediately became the clearinghouse for this unprecedented international exchange of young biologists, chemists, mathematicians, physicists and other natural scientists. W. E. Tisdale, who had been associated with the National Research Fellowship Program in Washington, was appointed to assist in extending the idea and he roved over most of Europe, interviewing candidates who had been proposed for fellowships. Never before had the search for superior brains been prosecuted over so wide and diverse an area. And notice they're going for superior, superior brains, not superior hearts and guts. And, uh, you know, because they, 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 they admire and, and uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? You know, venerate the, the, the logical, rational uh, mind over and above, you know, the heart or the guts. Uh, the intuition and, and, and these other kind of senses that we have. So, yeah, they're just interested in brains. They're not looking for people who are moral and have uh, ethics and, and integrity. They just need to have a superior brain. And that superior brain also links into, you know, the, the preservation of the favored races, the, the subtitle to Charles Darwin's Origin of Species book and, you know, all the other stuff that we've been talking about on this, on this uh, broadcast. Uh, so never before had the search for superior brains been prosecuted over so wide and diverse an area, and many young people of inherent brilliance and talent were discovered. Two of them, Fermi of Italy and Heisenberg of Germany, later received Nobel Prizes. Altogether, in the years during which the International Education Board was active, 509 fellows in the natural sciences were selected from 35 nations, most of them going to other... If you're getting this... Testing, testing. Are we there? Is anything going on? It looks like we are still there. Okay, I think we're back. We got booted there for a second, but I think we are back now as far as I can tell. Uh, yeah. My in yeah, my internet connection just cut. Creepy. Let me know if I'm coming through or not. I'll scratch my nose while I'm waiting. Back, back, back. Okay. Weird. I don't know what happened. So, and I've totally lost my place now. Oh yeah, it was Niels Bohr, wasn't it? Okay, so I think we're up here. In the same way, Rose and his associates picked other strategic centers of research and training where leadership was strong but equipment or other facilities were inadequate. And by the judicious distribution of an appropriation here, a grant in aid there, and a traveling professorship in another place, they gave these institutions a greater usefulness. At no time was any consideration given to the idea of weighing the claims of one country against another and dividing the assistance on a basis of geographical balance. I'm just going to move this for a second over there because I've lost, lost view of the chat. Okay, sweet. Let me move. Okay, I just got to move some things around because... There we go. Apologies for that. Although it wasn't my fault. I didn't do anything. At no time was any consideration given to the idea of weighing the claims of one country against another and dividing the assistance on a basis of geographical balance. So this is telling you that they're, they're already thinking in an international world, uh, you know, beyond borders, let's say. Always the criterion was ability. Which man, which institution, which locality offered the greater opportunity for the advancement of knowledge? One of the most promising places in Rose's belief was the University of Copenhagen. In addition to the Institute for Theoretical Physics, it included an Institute of Physical Chemistry under J.N. Bronsted and a Department of Physiology under August Krog, both of which enjoyed worldwide renown and attracted graduate students from many countries. But both were hampered by overcrowded quarters and limited equipment. Here was an opportunity to strengthen teaching and research, not in one science only, but in three. 
So at the same time that the grant was made to enlarge Professor Bohr's Institute for Theoretical Physics, another was voted to assist the development of Professor Krogh's department into an institute of physiology. And four years later, a third grant was made for the construction and equipment of a building to house the Institute of Physical Chemistry. The Danish government and other donors, both local and outside, joined in the effort to increase the and integrate Copenhagen's facilities in the natural sciences. And subsequent grants by the foundation have raised a total of Rockefeller assistance to $800,000. Copenhagen became one of the first universities to work out a close correlation of research effort between biology and chemistry and physics. Many important results have come from the juxtaposition of the three institutes, notably early applications of the use of isotopes to physiological research. Another centre that offered multiple opportunities was the University of Göttingen. It was particularly strong in its physics department, which occupied an obsolete building known as the Physical Institute and its mathematical faculty, through inconveniently, though inconveniently scattered among various buildings, was one of the most brilliant in Europe. The board's grant to Göttingen enabled the university to enlarge the quarters and improve the laboratory equipment of the Physical Institute and to erect nearby a mathematical institute which provided spacious housing both for mathematical research and teaching and for close collaboration with the physicists. Thereafter, Göttingen became more than ever before a world center for graduate study in these fields. Many of America's leading mathematicians and mathematical physicists were trained there, some of them on Rockefeller fellowships. The world's resources in mathematics were further enhanced by a substantial contribution to the University of Paris. This assisted the building of the mathematical center known as the Institute Henry Poincaré and endowed a new professorship. With these improved facilities and enlarged faculty, Paris shared popularity with Göttingen as a place for the advanced study of mathematics and theoretical physics. Quote, the meeting of the board at which Dr. Rose presented the mathematical projects for Göttingen and the University of Paris stands out in, mem in the memory of all who attended it. For Rose reported, with the aid of elaborate charts and diagrams, not on mathematics at Göttingen or Paris alone, but on mathematics in every leading institution around the world. He was reporting on where man had arrived in his mathematical thinking and where the opportunities for progress seemed brightest. His performance was characteristic of the immense pains and thoroughgoing analysis with which he scanned every recommendation he brought before the trustees. Göttingen and Paris were preferred. In his judgment of all the places in the world at that time, they represented the peaks in mathematical science. The board's projects in physics included grants to the University of Leiden for low temperature research, to a Norwegian committee for the erection of the Institute of Cosmical Physics at Tromsø, and to the Jungfrau High Altitude Institute for an observatory and laboratory later built on the Sphinx. The lofty promontory which flanks the Jungfrau Jok in Switzerland. For a second I thought they meant the actual Sphinx, but it's a place in Switzerland. Which is very curious. That is very curious indeed. Why would Switzerland have a place called the Sphinx? What's the connection there between Switzerland and ancient Egypt? Funds given the Spanish Junta for the extension of research and scientific investigations built the Institute of Physics and Chemistry in Madrid, a planting of great promise whose flowering was blighted by Spain's civil war. Several important contributions were made to chemistry. A grant to the University of Uppsala aided the Svedberg's experiments, which resulted in the development of an improved type of ultra-centrifuge, an apparatus which today is an indispensable tool of research in biochemical laboratories all over the world. A larger grant to the University of Stockholm completed a fund to build a modern laboratory for Hans von Euler's studies and this Stockholm Biological Institute is an important center of research in enzyme chemistry. In biology, the International Education Board provided numerous items of material assistance, a biological laboratory for Harvard, buildings and endowment for biological laboratories at the University of Edinburgh and Cambridge University, a herbarium building for the Jardin des Plantes in Paris, 
and enlargement of facilities for the Marine Biological Station at Plymouth, England, support for the Zoological Station at Naples, a gift toward endowment of the Botanical Conservatory at Geneva, and library funds for the Society of Biology at Paris. Astronomy was not mentioned in Dr. Rose's plan to begin with chemi- physics, chemistry, and biology, but opportunities in this field were presented for consideration and several received favorable action. A grant to the Harvard College Ab- Observatory enabled it to move its southern station from Peru to a more satisfactory site in South Africa and provided the new outpost with a 60 inch reflecting telescope. Smaller funds were given to the National Academy of Sciences in Washington to finance a bibliography of planets and to the University of Lyon in France for its study of variable stars. Finally, in the last year of the board's active life, a few weeks before Dr. Rose retired, the largest gift and the most magnificent venture of the entire natural science program was voted, $6 million to the California Institute of Technology for the construction and installation of a 200-inch telescope. The details of this venture are discussed in a subsequent chapter. I'm just going to read ahead, see how many more. Okay, we only got like four pages left. Three. Okay, part three. While the International Education Board was thus putting Rose's scheme into effect on a global scale, the General Education Board under Rose's leadership was pursuing a parallel course within the United States. To be fair, to be sure, the international program itself included several projects in that country. For example, the Great Telescope and the Biological Laboratory at Harvard, but Rose's principal agency for operation in the homeland was the General Education Board. For many years, as we have seen, this board had been making grants for for general endowment, and by 1925 its gifts for that purpose had totaled $60 million distributed among more than 200 American colleges and universities. In most of these institutions, the natural sciences, along with the other faculty departments, benefited from the increased endowment But until Rose became president, there had been no systematic program within the Rockefeller boards specifically to help them, such as had been designed for the medical sciences. Under Rose's leadership, the board expressed its conviction that, on the whole, the progress of civilization coincides with the increase of accurate knowledge and the spread of the objective and dispassionate spirit of scientific inquiry. On the basis of this conviction, it announced that, The General Education Board is now definitely undertaking to cooperate in improving the situation of the physical and biological sciences. The first fruits of this decision were a series of notable grants made in 1925 to institutions reaching across the continent. One appropriation went to the California Institute of Technology toward endowment of its teaching and research in the physical and biological sciences. Another to Vanderbilt, which was endeavouring to lift its other departments to the high level attained by its recently reorganised School of Medicine. A third gift was to Princeton to reinforce its resources in mathematics, physics, astronomy, chemistry and biology. Finally, the Marine Biological Laboratory at Woods Hole, which had just completed its new building, was provided with funds to finance the purchase of books and periodicals for its library. It is significant that every one of these institutions received continuing support from the board. Rose had carefully selected them as key centers of teaching and research, strategically placed geographically and marked for strengthening. Subsequent grants voted by the General Education Board within the next four years brought the total of its assistance to the California Institute of Technology to two and a half million dollars, to Vanderbilt to more than a million to Princeton to two million, and to the Woods Hole Laboratory to half a million. In the year 1927, the General Education Board began a series of appropriations to the University of Chicago for science departments. By 1930, these gifts had mounted to more than two and a three quarter million dollars, providing the university with additional facilities in physics, chemistry, and biology, including new buildings for the departments of hygiene, bacteriology and anatomy. Physics was advanced by a grant to Harvard for a new research laboratory, the building now known as the Lyman Laboratory. Biological investigation was the beneficiary of a six-year grant to the University of Texas. 
at Stanford, graduate work in physics, chemistry, biology, and mathematics was aided by a series of appropriations extending over several years. The erection of science buildings was assisted in Radcliffe College, Hendricks College in Arkansas, and Ral Randolph Macon Women's College in Virginia, while improved facilities for research and teaching were provided at Wellesley. Grants to the National Academy of Sciences aided publications in mathematics and biology, and a special appropriation to the Academy financed a survey of the status of oceanographical research in the United States. Grants to the National Research Council enabled a committee of the Council to evaluate studies of the effects of radiation on living material. Again and again, in his annual reports as president of the two boards, Rose declared his faith in science. There you go again. It's about faith in science. On one occasion, he felt moved to justify the support of research. In the first place, he reasoned, the scientific spirit, characterized by the objective and disinterested search for facts, is gradually invading other fields, industry, politics, law. The more solid and adequate the basic sciences become, the greater authority will scientific method win in realms not yet subdued. The more completely the world the world of physical, chemical, and biological phenomena can be described and accounted for, the more prestige does the scientific attitude require as respect in other fields. And in the second place, whether we will or no, civilization has become increasingly a matter of applied science. To be sure, science can be and is misapplied, but this is not to be laid at the door of science. Health, transportation, food, education, these are realms of activity that cannot be properly managed until more is known. The increase of knowledge upon which human welfare depends comes largely from the laboratories dealing in the most fundamental fashion with the physical and biological sciences. In cultivating these, universities make, therefore, a notable contribution not only to knowledge as such, but to the art of living. In the summer of 1928, Rose resigned from both boards. He had reached the retirement age of 65 and his work was done. Ah, the good old days when the retirement age was 65. <laughs> I want to climb a mountain and go fishing, he wrote in a letter to a friend. You don't want to wait till you're 65 to do that, man. <laughs> his story has significance because of its background. In an interlude between two great world catastrophes, a man of singular intellectual power whose name was scarcely known, even by his contemporaries, but who had already made a monumental contribution to public health, was suddenly possessed by the faith of Aristotle that the salvation of mankind lay in the extension of knowledge. Moreover, he was fortunate enough to find financial backing for his faith, so that in his lifetime he had the chance of putting it to the test in many practical forms around the world. As he was fortunate in his life, so he was fortunate in his death. He did not live to see the days when the intellectual wealth of Europe, to which he had himself made so strategic a contribution, would be scattered and dissipated. He died happy in the belief that human intelligence could master the difficulties ahead and that the growing extension of knowledge across boundaries would provide both the tools and the atmosphere in which a new kind of future could be built. In the end, social forces of which he was unaware tore his ordered world of mathematics and physics to pieces, and by a bitter irony, used as instruments in the destruction the very sciences upon which he based his faith. Of course, this is not the final conclusion of the story, nor can the moral of Rose's life end on a pessimistic note. His far-ranging experiment for promoting the natural sciences lives on in the lives of many people, and in ways which neither he nor his contemporaries could have understood. His philosophy may yet be justified. And that is the end of chapter 12. And as I already said, the next one is experimental biology. Ooh, well. I'm gonna have a sip. So, I am... Definitely going to have to wrap this up. <laughs> Two and a half hours at this time of night and I'm starting to mess up my words and get all sorts of things wrong. So apologies about that. It wasn't quite as smooth 
as I usually could be. Um, but it's just because it's getting late. It's way past my bedtime. I'm usually in bed by about half nine. If anyone's interested in that little fact, I don't know why it would be. But uh, let's have a final review of the chat. So what's really standing out to me, though, before we go to the comments is the, this this mingling of religious language to describe science, talking about roses, roses, uh, what did he say? Like he was giving ministry to the world and how he, how he has faith in his science. Um, very much trying to put science in the place of religion. And as we, uh, as uh, William, I think, very correctly pointed out, what about the metaphysics? Like Jay Dyer always argues, it's like you're using numbers and you're using logics, but how do you justify the use of those things? Where do they come from? Because the scientific method itself cannot prove uh, the existence of, of numbers and logic. And that's just two, two examples, numbers and logic. You know, there's other, I think, transcendental categories which can be used in this line of, of argumentation. So, yeah, and that's all been done away with. The, the, the presuppositions are just that numbers exist. And But this is like the silliness of, of the Big Bang Theory. It's like there was nothing and then it exploded and then out of random chaos that had no order and no purpose and no design came numbers and, uh, you know, the golden ratio uh, and, this, and this perfectly incredibly balanced system and these incredible organisms. It just doesn't make any sense. But sorry about the, um, the uh, cutting out there. No, I, I could probably w like wire my computer in. Currently, it's not wired in. Excuse me. Couple of sneezes there. Yeah, currently I'm just on a Wi-Fi connection, so I need to f figure out. You know, I need to think about getting that properly wired in, so that uh, th these kind of dropouts can't happen as much. But all right, so. Let's have a look. Oh, we got loads of comments. I don't think I'm going to have to get through all these. So I'm happy for you guys to be going backwards and forward um, on different topics. I'm very glad that people are talking about these important things because it is. Um, yeah, thank you for bearing with me while I struggle through the pronunciation of that word that I got stuck on then. Pedagogical. There, nailed it first time. So my nose is running and I'm and my internet's struggling and uh, I'm I'm sneezing and whatever. So I think it's time to wrap up. Uh, yeah, looks good. Intentional. There's a guy that goes. Yeah. So Heidi, you said there's a guy that goes into all the fishy stuff in Switzerland. I've been listening to that guy. Not all of the stuff, but it's very very intriguing. Uh, G i u r e h in capitals with full stops between each letter. Uh, I think is his G i u r e. -H. Edge. something like that his channel is really interesting because he's there he's filming the videos he's showing you the uh the symbols and the carvings and very very fascinating stuff oh i've still got the book come on apologies about that okay rachel wilson lj says uh rachel wilson oh sorry william says rachel wilson's book was poignant in exposing the occult roots of feminism that's one i really need to get definitely need to get that LJ, glad I didn't miss too much, but we'll go back. Thanks again, Nick. You're very, very welcome. Gwen says, very well read. I couldn't read for that long. <laughs> Take uh, Practice. Practice makes better, you know? So, uh, and then, yeah, Ethernet connection, much better to have. Yeah. So that's it. That's what we're doing. We're trying to, we're trying to build this as we go along. There's a good metaphor Richard Grove uses, which is like you, you jump out the plane and you build the parachute on the way down. And that's kind of what we're doing here. We just started doing something and then we're just going to make it better as we go along. And you are all, you know, the key critical element here. We're really trying to, uh, I'm kind of envisioning this as a sort of research community, a learning community, the sharing of resources, uh, particularly in the Telegram group. We've got lots of things coming in there, lots of uh, links, and we're looking up documents and sharing ideas and throwing out, throwing comments back and forth because I think, you know, none of us has the full picture. Uh, we all have different puzzle pieces and we're just trying to like slot them. Hey, does this bit fit with your bit over there? And is if it does, let's put them together. And if it doesn't, then why doesn't it? And maybe we need another piece from this person over here to make those connect. And 
And that's what it is about. It's collaboration and nobody is the guru. Nobody is the, the be all and end all that has everything, in my opinion, you know. But uh, this is why I think it's good to have this um, like group that's forming. Uh, and it's nice to see the familiar faces coming back and participating and getting active in the chat and, and asking questions. And yeah, it's lovely. So I'm very humbled and grateful. And I hope uh, you're enjoying this too. Uh, you must be. Because you keep coming back, if, if uh, you know, unless you're masochists, in which case it's a bit weird. <laughs> but as always, I'm very grateful to have you here. So let's uh, let's call that a night. I think. Let me get my uh, outro music ready. Uh, Peter saying, like I mentioned last time, don't start running a recruitment campaign. Like Carlson is. Who's Carlson? Randall Carlson. He's the only Carlson I can think of. The guy with the big beard who talks about um, catastrophism. Is he recruiting right now? Well, I don't have any jobs available. This is all. Uh, this is a one-man show here. It's a one-man band uh, at the moment, you know. And I've got my guru nerd friend who's going to teach me about setting up the Raspberry Pi, but she's she's doing that kind of just on a voluntary exchange basis. So <laughs> for now, it's just yes, Randall Carlson. There you go. Cool. Yeah, so now it's just me always looking for Masons. Oh, yeah, because he's a pretty open Mason, isn't he? <laughs> I went to this this old house, Lime, Lime Hall, uh, near Manchester, and there was pictures of big portraits of people with uh, Masonic hand gestures and feet at 90-degree angles, you know, and I was kind of attuned to spotting it because I've been, you know, swimming in these waters for a while, and I was like, that's a Masonic thing. You just start seeing it everywhere, don't you? Okay. Cool. Thank you all for being here. And uh, I hope you have a peaceful and relaxing remainder of your weekend. Sunday, tomorrow, the day of rest, relaxation. Uh, you know, try saying a prayer. If you're not the praying type, give it a go. Just uh, I, I, honestly, I literally started by going, well, God, if you're a real and I'm talking to you and uh, and I and I literally I talked to God as though God was all loving and all knowing. So if, just imagine you're talking to an all-loving, all-knowing entity, just as an ex, just as a exercise, you know, just imagine that and talk to it and see what you find yourself saying. And it's quite incredible and revealing and powerful. And, and it really did make a big difference to me uh, just as a, just as an exercise in and of itself. I would go for walks and I would kind of talk and people would look at me strange like who's that guy talking to but this day and age it doesn't matter they just assume you've got some ear pods in and you're on the phone so you can walk around talking to yourself or talking to god out in the open nowadays and it's fine no one's gonna bat an eyelid <laughs> so so there's a bonus i suppose from all the technology and technocracism that's going on out there uh, okay i'm actually gonna stop rambling now thank you all uh, so much uh, i'll be back tuesday night we'll be continuing with experimental biology story of the Rockefeller, Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, links under the video for the things I discussed in this uh, episode and also ways to support affiliate products, that sort of stuff. I'm sure you're all familiar with it by now. Uh, so with that said, yeah, that's, that's it. That's all I've got to say. So uh, I will just get my next thing ready to go and I will say to you good night and also God bless. <laughs>